Good morning to those of you here and to those of you watching the event online. Welcome to today's AEI policy event. Today we are discussing the Federal Reserve Board's new proposed rule that will allow it to decide which banks earn interest on reserve accounts and which banks earn nothing. Today, all banks are paid the same rate on their reserve balances, the so-called IOER rate. In chaos theory, the butterfly effect is a phenomenon whereby a seemingly small, insignificant change in a system can trigger forces that, once they work through the system, generate huge impacts. The classic metaphoric example is a butterfly in the Canary Islands flaps its wings and it initiates atmospheric eddies that weeks later grow into an Atlantic hurricane. Like the butterfly effect, seemingly small, innocuous changes in law can have enormous unanticipated effects years later. For example, a few short sentences in an uncontroversial law passed by Congress in 2006 have unintentionally given rise to massive changes in the way the Fed conducts monetary policy. The Financial Service Regulatory Relief Act of 2006, among other things, gave the Federal Reserve the authority to pay interest on bank reserve balances. At the time, this new authority was marketed as a technical adjustment of little practical consequence. Historically, the requirement for banks to hold unremunerated reserve balances was criticized as an implicit tax on banks a tax that disadvantaged banks relative to competing financial services institutions like money market mutual funds that did not have to hold reserves. As a practical matter, by 2006, the burden of this unfair bank reserve tax had largely been minimized. The Fed abolished reserve requirements on most accounts and lowered reserve requirements on others. Meanwhile, banks had devised ways to reduce required reserves by sweeping customer balances intraday between accounts that required reserves and accounts that had no reserve requirement. By 2006, the bank reserve tax was in practice no longer a significant drag on bank profits. Still, the Federal Reserve Board's authority to pay interest on bank reserves was intended to remove this unfair reserve tax and thereby reduce the incentive for banks to expend resources to artificially lower the required reserves they held at the Fed. The Fed's authority to pay interest on reserve was not scheduled to take effect until 2011, but with the onset of the financial crisis, Congress accelerated the implementation and allowed the Fed to begin paying interest in late 2008. The push to accelerate the Fed's authority was triggered by the Fed's aggressive asset purchases, which ballooned bank excess reserve balances during a period when the federal funds market ceased to function. In the federal funds market, banks lend banks and other financial institutions funds from their reserve balance accounts in uncollateralized transactions. With the autumn 2008 crisis of confidence in the financial markets, the demand for liquidity among institutions soared as did the uncertainty regarding the financial solvency of most bank counterparties. Few banks were willing to lend their excess reserves except to banks of the highest quality, and those banks already held large excess reserve balances. All of a sudden, there was a large supply of excess reserve in a system and no demand for excess reserve balances among creditworthy banks. This market dysfunction disrupted federal funds trading and drove the federal funds rate to near zero. In order to keep the federal funds rate above zero, the Federal Reserve started paying banks interest on their reserve balances in an attempt to put a floor under the federal funds rate. Indeed, from late 2008 through today, the interest rate on bank reserves is the tool that the Federal Reserve Board uses to set the federal funds rate. Notice I said the Federal Reserve Board and not the Federal Open Market Committee. While the FOMC is the body that officially charts monetary policy, the 2006 law places the authority over interest on reserve balances with the Federal Reserve Board, not the FOMC. A technicality for sure, but one that could create issues should a future administration pack the Federal Reserve Board with governors that held monetary policy views that demurred from those of the FOMC. For many technical reasons, paying interest on bank reserves did not accomplish what the Fed had set out to accomplish, to put a floor on the federal funds rate. More about that from our panelists, I'm sure, today. But the ability to pay interest on reserves did set in motion enormous changes in the way the Federal Reserve monetary policy impacts the banking system and the economy. 
changes that were mostly unanticipated in the fall of 2008. When the Fed started paying interest on reserves, the percentage of banking system assets in reserve balances, the percentage of system deposits in reserve balances jumped from 7% to 16%. The increase in bank reserve holdings came at the expense of fewer bank loans. Before the crisis, more than 93% of bank deposits were used to fund bank loans. After they began paying interest on reserves, less than 70% of bank deposits are used to fund consumer and business loans. Another unanticipated consequence of paying interest on reserves is that newly specialized startup banks have sought to join Club Fed so they too can earn the rich IOER rate. Among these startups are new state chartered limited purpose banks approved to operate a simple business model where they collect large deposits from money market mutual funds and similar institutions. These banks plan to invest these deposits exclusively in a Fed master account and earn the IOER rate. Because their costs will be low, the new institutions can keep only a small spread and pass most of the IOER onto mutual fund shareholders, improving the interest rates you and I earn on our savings. On average, banks have passed very little of their IOER earnings onto their business and retail depositors. So after more than 10 years of earning near zero interest earnings on their bank deposits, my guess is that most consumers would welcome additional competition for their deposits. But the Fed? Not so much. The Fed has proposed rule changes that will allow it to pay different banks different interest rates on the reserves, including a rate of zero. Under this proposal, the Fed itself chooses which banks qualify for a high rate, which qualify for a low rate, and which earn nothing. It is my opinion that the Fed's proposed rule is in conflict with legal precedents that require the Fed to provide banks equal access to Fed services, but I'm an economist, not a lawyer and it's certainly possible that legal technicalities could allow the Fed to prevail. If enacted, these rule changes give the Fed a new dangerous power, the power to use interest rate on bank reserves to choose which banks are winners and which are losers, including blocking new bank entrants the Fed deems undesirable. In 2006, when Congress gave the Federal Reserve Board authority to pay banks interest on reserves, it never imagined the Fed would use that authority to pay Fed favored banks higher interest rates on their reserves, but today that's exactly what the Fed is proposing to do. Is the Fed's latest proposal legal? Is it good economic policy? In today's AEI event, we will hear opinions from two expert panels, one focused on the issues of access to Federal Reserve services and the Fed's proposal to pay banks different interest rates, and a second panel focused on finan the financial stability implications of allowing new limited purpose banks access to Federal Reserve Services. So with that by way of summary, let me introduce the moderator of our first panel. Oliver Ireland is a partner at Morrison & Forrester LLP. His practice focuses on retail financial services and bank regulatory issues, including consumer protection regulation, consumer protection powers and initiatives, and all types of payment transactions, including compliance with National Automated Clearinghouse Association's rules. Mr. Ireland's practice also includes regulatory issue, issues applicable to banks and thrift holding companies and to national and state charters banks, federal and state chartered thrifts, and federal and state chartered credit unions, as well, as well as other financial regulatory issues, including margin lending. Mr. Mr. Ireland pre previously serves as an associate general counsel for the Federal Reserve Board, and he's just a generally smart legal mind. Let me wel please welcome Ali Ireland. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, Paul said we're here to talk about access to Fed services, particularly the deposit function, the interest rate deposit function. Uh, Paul indicated that uh, the Fed had put out a proposed rulemaking on this issue. Uh, that's not quite true. What they've put out is what's called an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. And in this context, the uh, difference is significant. Uh, as a legal matter, we have a, an institution, I believe, chartered in the state of Connecticut, that has applied for a Federal Reserve account in order, uh, in part, to earn interest. It hasn't gotten that account. It has sought to assert its legal rights in the court <coughs> to obtain such an account, and the Fed has put out what they call 
in what is known in administrative procedure as an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Now that means we're thinking about doing something in this area. We don't yet have an idea as to what that looks like. And so we're interested in your views on it and we want to hear more. And once we get your views, we're going to think about that for a while and come up, maybe come up with a proposal, and then we'll get your views on the proposal, and then we'll think about that, and then we'll decide what we want to do. Typically, um, even on a fast track, ANPR to final rule is probably 18 months to a couple of years. Uh, it can be longer than that in practice. Uh, there is, as I said, litigation going on in the meantime. It had occurred to me as a possibility that the Fed, uh, in putting this out, thought that perhaps the court, in litigating, deciding to litigate this issue, wouldn't want to render a decision in the middle of the Fed contemplating what policy it was going to formulate. And so th the proposal may effectively drag the issue out for some period of time. Uh, The uh, issue, nonetheless, is there. The Fed's paying a significant rate of interest in the time. There is interest in these accounts. The uh, comment period for this advance notice of proposed rulemaking expires uh, on May 13th. We're about a week away. I looked at the Federal Reserve's uh, Freedom of Information Act postings on their website, which is where they post comments on rulemaking. They have six comments so far. Uh, two of them are from the same person. I think it's a double somehow. And none of them are particularly substantive. So it's not clear where this is going. Uh, it is possible that the Fed will get comments on the broader issue of how they conduct monetary policy, as Paul pointed out. The process has shifted from a focus on reserves and an active Fed funds market to a relatively inactive Fed funds market and a focus on the interest on required and interest on excess reserves, primarily interest on excess reserves. Uh, to talk about those issues, if the Fed is going to do this, what they've proposed, which I think is actually consistent with the statute, I don't think they're on a legal adventure yet. But what they've proposed is we can pay different rates for different banks. And the statute says they can pay different rates for different banks. There is a separate statute that applies to the Fed and other regulatory agencies called the Administrative Procedure Act that says you can't do anything that is arbitrary or capricious or not in accordance with the statute. So they're probably not going to run into it not in accordance with the statute, but the question is arbitrary and capricious. They will get some deference from the courts as they draw lines, but what line are they going to draw and how are they going to justify that line? And that's uh, really the topic of our pan my panel this morning. Uh, we have a very interesting group to talk about that. The first one up is going to be Bert Ely. Bert is not, is unusual in this panel in that he is not a Fed alumni. As a matter of fact, some people could say, suggest that Bert is not a fan of the Fed. He once gave me at a program someplace a yellow button that said on it, who needs the Fed, that he was handing out to other participants in the program. Uh, however, Bert is a keen observer of the banking community. He was one of the first people to identify the thrift crisis and the problems of the thrift crisis. This is not the recent financial meltdown. This is the 1980s meltdown of the thrift industry that led to the abolition of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. And he was an early identifier of the most recent financial crisis. I can remember talking to Bird about this in 2007 before Bear Stearns failed, before uh, Lehman failed, and Burke commenting that this was 
reminded him of the prior crisis, only it was bigger and it was rolling out a whole lot more, a lot, whole lot faster. And I think he turned out to be right. So Bert and his observations on the banking community here will be uh, interesting. We also have Andrew Levin, who is a uh, professor of economics at Dartmouth and has a long string of credentials working with the US Central Bank, uh, an advisor in particular on monetary policy issues to the chair and vice chair of the Federal Reserve in relatively recent times. He's been an advisor to the International Monetary Fund. And I have here a list of foreign central banks that he's been an advisor to. And so we have somebody that has got a broader perspective on the methods of conducting monetary policy, I think, and thinking about those things. And that's one of the issues here is the methods of conducting monetary policy. And if you look at the Federal Reserve's advance notice of proposed rulemaking, there are in it references to relatively smaller economy central bank practices to justify what the Fed is proposing. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, we also have another um, individual who came out, of the, came out of the Fed, Bill Nelson, um, is the chief economist of the Bank Policy Institute. He worked in the monetary policy function as an economist at the Federal Reserve Board for many years, for many years while I was there and uh, understands not only the broader policies of conducting monetary policy, but the techniques of conducting monetary policy. And we're talking about a technique of monetary policy. And uh, it would be interesting to hear what Bill has to say. We're going to start off with Bert. We will follow with Andrew Levin, and then we'll wind up with Bill. Sit here. You yes, you should come up. If you can, you want to speak from there. You can speak from here. We can do it any way you want. No, I'll just speak from here. <clears throat> okay. Should I go? Go. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul, for the opportunity to be here today, and to Ollie for that introduction. And by the way, I think I still have some of those yellow uh, who needs the Fed buttons laying around someplace. Uh -huh. Maybe I should get some more made up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And uh, I'm going to just uh, run through, click through some slides here about uh, uh, this proposal uh, and try to present it in, uh, in, in a reasonably uh, factual uh, manner. Um, first of all, I think. Uh, what we have today with the, uh, with the uh, proposals on the table essentially is a variant of the so-called narrow bank idea that uh, had quite a bit of uh, popularity and discussion uh, in, in the 80s and in 90s. Uh, nothing ever uh, 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 came of it. But um, uh, what we're looking at today, in, in effect, is a, a variant of that, of a bank that would have a very narrow customer base and a very narrow range of, uh, of assets. Uh, now, as uh, Ali pointed out, uh, we've had a Fed balance sheet that uh, grew quite a bit. When the Fed uh, engaged uh, after the uh, 2008 financial crisis to really uh, bring down uh, interest rates across the board, and you can see here in this chart, and in order to do so, it had to uh, uh, greatly expand, it had to buy lots of securities, which ballooned out uh, its, uh, its balance sheet. Uh, and uh, reduce the supply of, of Treasury securities as well as uh, mortgage-backed securities uh, and, and GSE debt. And that had the effect of, uh, of, uh, in, uh, of driving down uh, supply relative to demand, and rates came down. And as you can see, that has uh, continued. A big question from a monetary policy standpoint is, uh, at what point in time will we get back to so-called normalization of, uh, of interest rates, not only in terms of the level of rates, but also uh, the differential between uh, short, medium, and long-term rates. That's, of course, a, an open question right now. Uh, the president, of course, would like to drive these rates uh, uh, even, even lower, which might expand the Fed balance sheet uh, uh, further. But um, uh, essentially, uh, the, the Fed pay, uh, financed the purchase of these securities 
through the creation of, of excess reserves. Uh, it, to simplify uh, the example, they would um, uh, uh, buy securities from a bank, treasury securities or otherwise from a bank, and put a deposit uh, in the bank's account at the Federal Reserve. And that's what led to the creation of uh, excess reserves. The thing that's uh, interesting is that uh, excess reserves are uh, have been declining, as you can see here from the, the chart, they're already down about 40% from the peak uh, that they reached. And of course, the big question right now uh, from a monetary standpoint uh, and an interest rate standpoint, is, that is uh, how much further will they, uh, they shrink? And I'm gonna come back to that again uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. But that's the, exi it's the existence of that substantial quantity of excess reserves that leads to the proposal that uh, we have before us today. Now, um, uh, something that's not widely recognized is that uh, effectively a substantial portion of the federal debt uh, has been financed by these excess reserves because those reserves are used to buy uh, a treasury debt that has been put on the uh, uh, on, on the federal balance or on the Fed balance sheet. Uh, and uh, the re interest that the uh, Fed is paying on these reserves is interest on what essentially is a taxpayer-backed asset. That is. Uh, uh, the, the balances uh, at, at the Fed, because of course the Fed is effectively a, a federal instrumentality and is not gonna go broke. Um, now, uh, big question is why does the Fed pay in ex interest on excess reserves? They, for a long time, didn't pay interest on reserves. Uh, they, are a, they have now become a very significant uh, asset uh, for, for the banks, about eight and a half percent right now for the, the banking industry. Think about this, almost 10% Almost one dollar out of ten of uh, bank assets in this country are uh, uh, in the form of excess reserves, and so it costs money to, to uh, for the banks to finance uh, this asset, and that's why the Fed has to pay uh, interest on excess reserves. It's essentially to cover the banking industry's cost of, of holding these reserves. And what are some of these uh, costs? Well, first of all, it is interest that the banks have to pay on their deposits that are funding uh, the excess reserves, uh, FDIC insurance premiums, operating expenses, and uh, because these reserves have blown out the size of bank balance sheets, that's increased their equity capital requirements, and of course the banks have to return, earn a return on that. So the, bank, the Fed has no choice, as a practical matter, but to pay interest on these excess uh, uh, reserves. Um, now, the, the narrow bank concept, or as it's now called, the, the, the pass-through uh, uh, investment entity, or, or PTI, uh, uh, would avoid many of these costs. Uh, that This is why I characterize this concept as being nothing more than a simple regulatory arbitrage. And I think that's the way it needs to be seen. Arbitrage in the sense that the PTIs will be able to avoid a lot of costs that uh, regular commercial banks have. They don't have to pay deposit insurance premiums because under their charter with the state of Connecticut, uh, they, would, they would hold deposits that wouldn't have to be FDIC uh, insured. They would be essentially wholesale institutions, very few employees, and therefore have low operating expenses. Uh, they would have uh, uh, lower regulatory costs. Uh, presumably, they would not be subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. And uh, they would be able to operate with uh, much higher leverage, that is, lower capital uh, ratios because of the riskless nature of their uh, assets. Uh, and it's these cost savings that would be shared with the large institutions that would be their depositors. So that's, in effect, there would be a regulatory arbitrage. Some of the uh, benefit of it will go to the depositors and the PTIs. The rest will go to the uh, shareholders of the PTIs. Um, and in effect, uh, the PTIs will be more like, I characterize them as a, more like a money market mutual fund that is investing in treasury secu securities but it'll be doing it in the context of operating with a, a bank charter. Now, there are risks to the PTI business model. Uh, first of all is the existential risk that uh, excess reserves might shrink back to their 2008 levels, in which case there'd be nothing left for them to, uh, to, to, uh, to effectively invest in. Um, uh, the second is that the PTIs will be paid a significantly lower interest rate on their, on their Fed balances that uh, Ali pointed out is a possibility. I had a, uh, an opportunity recently to uh, uh, ask uh, uh, Fed Vice Chairman Randy Quarles if, if this was really legal, if this is kosher. And he said that uh, uh, they, uh, the Fed attorneys have opined that uh, it can pay that interest rate uh, uh, differential. And I can assure you that from uh, uh, the banking industry would certainly push uh, for that differential because they would like 
the P ties, if they ever get off the ground, to be paid as little as possible, and the banking industry, of course, to be paid as much as possible. So there you can see an interesting uh, political uh, 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 battle uh, developing. But the other thing is that, uh, uh, is what would kind of regulatory costs would be imposed on the P ties? They, uh, they might start off with very little in the way of regulatory obligations or capital requirements, uh, but any increase in regulatory uh, costs or capital requirements would wipe out the PTI uh, rate advantage. So again, it's important to keep in mind that there are risks to this, uh, this business model. Now, um, there are of course the political issues and uh, Ali again uh, and, uh, uh, touched on them. They will, in fact, are drawing uh, intense political opposition from uh, the established uh, uh, banks. And uh, this is particularly true for the relative handful of banks that are custodial banks, uh, such as uh, Bank of New York uh, Mellon uh, and Northern Trust, that do an awful lot of business with these, these institutional depositors that the PTIs want to, to take away. So we got a little bit of a, a, a intra-industry warfare uh, potential uh, there. Um, the other thing that I haven't seen discussed at all in that is what is the impact of the PTIs on the FDIC? Because deposits that are now currently insured by the FDIC and on which uh, deposit insurance premiums are paid would no longer be part of the FDIC uh, assessment base and that would reduce FDIC uh, uh, income. So I suspect the FDIC does not think favorably uh, of this proposal. And of course, then there's a question I think the second panel will get into more, and that is what might be the impact of the next crisis on the PTIs? And I say the next crisis, because there will be some kind of crisis at some time in, in the future. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, economic history has uh, said that we have not yet gotten past the point of having uh, financial crises. And so um, if the PTIs really get quite large uh, and become significant and start to see have significant distorting impacts on the, on the financial system, Congress is certainly going to weigh in. And again, one of the ways they might weigh in is in terms of regulatory burden as well as uh, capital requirements. So again, uh, this is uh, an issue that the, the PTIs pose. And with that, I conclude my remarks. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to what I'm sure will be a very interesting discussion. All right. Andrew? Who's going second? Oh, Bill, I'm Bill. Sorry. I, you go ahead, Bill. I, I guess it's teed yeah. up. Is yeah, it's right? teed up. Great. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm Bill Nelson from the Bank Policy Institute. Uh, Ali and Paul, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. The Bank Policy Institute is the trade association for the largest banks. It was uh, 50 largest banks. It was uh, formed uh, this summer by the merger of the Clearinghouse and the Financial Services Roundtable and continues the Clearinghouse's reputation of uh, advocacy through research uh, and uh, anyway, and better public policy outcomes uh, as a result. Uh, so I will speak today uh, in remarks that are, are similar to Bert's, but thank goodness uh, not contradicted by Bert, uh, largely. Uh, I plan on giving a, first a whirlwind review of monetary policy before, during, and after the Great Recession. Then I'm going to discuss some bad reasons and some good reasons why the Fed should not pay IOER to narrow banks. But then I'm going to end with what I think is a superior solution, which I think would actually get around the legal problems as well. Uh, so I'm going to start with some definitions. Uh, I think that for many of you in this room, these are going to be uh, known to you, but maybe not for all of you. So just to level set. First of all, reserves are deposits of depository institutions, which I'm going to call banks, at Federal Reserve banks. So uh, the demand for reserves, uh, are banks hold reserves to satisfy their reserve requirements. They hold them to meet their clearing needs. These are their checking accounts. And, and things come in and go out, and they need to hold some to make sure they don't go into overdraft. Uh, they hold them as a liquid asset. They're the perfect liquid asset. They're available instantly at a known amount. Uh, and they're, uh, now that the Fed pays interest on reserves, banks hold them as an investment. Uh, now, the supply of reserves is fixed by the Fed balance sheet. The Fed creates reserves. Those reserves are going to find their way somewhere onto the, into the banking <coughs> system, and prices adjust to make the banks do that willingly. That's how monetary policy works. Uh, and they're a liability of the Fed, along with currency, and they fund Fed, Fed's first. assets. So you can think about uh, the supply of reserves as Fed's assets minus currency. So excess reserves are reserves minus required reserves. Before crisis, those were about $1 to $2 billion on average. The Fed paid no interest on required reserves, on excess reserves or required reserves. So the banks sought to minimize them. Uh, 
After the wave of QEs in the crisis, they peaked out at $2.8 trillion, so that's more than 1,000 times higher. And they're currently about $1.5 trillion, so still about 1,000 times higher than they were before the crisis. So the IOER rate is the interest rate that the Fed pays on excess reserves. The federal funds rate is the overnight rate in which it's a market rate at which banks lend to one another onshore, unsecured, overnight. It's the rate that the FOMC targets. And uh, what the Fed calls pass-through investment entities, but which everyone else calls uh, Jamie's narrow bank idea, or JNBI, <laughs> is a bank that accepts only uninsured uh, institutional deposits and invests only in reserves. So, so uh, before crisis, the Fed conducted policy in what's called a corridor system, although the floor of the corridor was zero. So, I, uh, so every day, banks held the minimum amount that they could to, to avoid overdrafts. The Fed adjusted its assets to, to supply that minimum demand to keep the federal funds rate at the FOMC target. So in this graph, the supply is the orange vertical line, the demand is the purple line, the target is the dotted line, and the, every morning uh, I was involved in these calls, the Fed and the New York Fed would call, talk, and they would determine where that orange line needed to be to, to clear the market at the target. Um, and the discount rate puts the ceiling on the federal fund rate because why borrow in the market for more than you can borrow in the Fed? So the discount rate is the rate at which banks can borrow from the Fed. I realize it's more complicated than that. That's another presentation. Uh, but it wasn't that hard. Uh, that's the thing I want to emphasize. It wasn't that hard. Uh, you basically, you announced the new target and, move, and rates moved to that target and federal fund rate volatility was close to zero. I think there's this perception that it was really incredibly complicated. Uh, the Fed funds market consisted largely uh, of banks that had extra funds at the end of the day, lending them to banks that needed extra funds at the end of the day. Because in overall, banks wanted to keep their funds short, so, so, so this kind of clearing was an efficient way to do so. Now, uh, during the early phase of the crisis, the Fed made a lot of discount window loans, normal discount window loans, including through auctions. Uh, but the Fed was able to keep excess reserves low uh, by shedding Treasury securities. It was sterilizing those loans. So it continued to conduct policy the way that uh, it had normally been conducting policy. Now, after Lehman, so first of all, as was noted, Congress gave the Fed the authority to pay interest on reserves. And also after Lehman, the Fed's uh, credit facilities expanded, and the Fed was no longer able to sterilize those reserves, and the supply of reserves uh, went up. So the Fed had expected uh, the federal funds rate to go down to IOER, but no lower, because why should banks lend money to each other at a rate that's lower than the amount that they can just leave the funds on deposit at the Fed? But instead, and, and it's important to remember that when Lehman happened, that the, the federal the FOMC's target was above zero, noticeably above zero, the federal funds rate fell right below IOER. IOER did not work to control the federal funds rate. And the Fed was quite concerned about this and, 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 and studied this, and they concluded that IOER was not available for a broad enough set of institutions, particularly GSEs and FHLVs that have accounts at the Fed and have deposits at the Fed but don't earn IOER. So as the Fed boosted reserves through several rounds of QE, it worried that it would not be able to raise the federal funds rate when it was appropriate to do so. So to, so to port IOER, the Fed created the Overnight Reverse Repo Facility, Overnight RRP Facility, which conducts reverse repos with a wide range of financial institutions and GSEs, federal home loan banks, at the overnight RRP rate. Effectively, those institutions are also making deposits at the Fed and getting interest on them. The overnight RRP rate uh, was set 25 basis, basis points below IOER. Now, it's, it's useful to, to reflect on what were the pros and cons of the overnight RRP rate, because you're going to hear these later uh, when they were being discussed. So the advantage that, the, that was presented was basically it expands IOER to a broader set of institutions. This is all taken from the transcripts. And the disadvantages were, well, it's going to encourage flight to quality flows, and that's going to worsen uh, uh, periods of stress. In addition, it's going to cause changes in the financial intermediation that's going to be hard to anticipate. All right, so liftoff strategy. Uh, well, another, another thing that was uh, proposed at the time, and Jamie was a big advocate of this, were collateralized deposit accounts. These were uh, basically allowing depository institutions to take deposits that were collateralized 100% by excess reserves at the Fed. That gave them transparent savings that, were, that basically allowed them to pass IOER on to their customers. So, you know, it's a lot like the narrow bank, and, and no less of an authority than Janet Yellen said, I thought this idea of strengthening the IOER rate through collateralized accounts was really clever, was implementable, and was almost foolproof. 
Now, uh, the, these, these collateralized accounts were discussed again in 2014. We don't have the transcripts, we have the minutes, as a potential liftoff tool. They weren't adopted. Now, okay, December 2015, the Fed raises its target for the federal funds rate. It raises the FOR from 0 to 25 basis points, up to 25 to 50, 50 basis points, raises IOER to 50, overnight RRP to 25, and to everyone's great relief, the federal funds rate moved up 25 basis points, from about 12 basis points to about 37 basis points. And if you get this image of sort of the Nassau control room worried that a rocket won't go off, and it actually goes off and everyone's cheering, that's pretty much what it was like <laughs> at the Fed. Um, so the Fed funds market at that point consisted largely of GSEs that got the overnight RP rate, 25 basis points below OER, lending those funds to the branches of FBOs, which earned the IOER rate. So it was sort of a straight arbitrage between those two. Uh, I'm not going to go over why it was FBOs. Uh, and, and I'll say uh, that this is not exactly how the market looks now, but it looked that way for many years after the liftoff. Uh, so the federal funds traded between overnight RP and IOER because the GSCs and the FBOs split the difference. Bill, does everyone know what FBO is? Foreign banking organizations. Okay, the you. branches and agencies. <laughs> thank you. Uh, as the tightening continued, the Fed continued to uh, lift the uh, IOER rate, the orange line, and the over, uh, effect, overnight RP rate, the dotted line, and the federal funds rate traded in the middle. Importantly, if you'll notice on the very right, that's not quite true at the end. The overnight, R the effective fund funds rate has moved up to and maybe even a little bit below, above IOER. So the Fed was conducting policy in a floor system. Uh, essentially, excess reserves were abundantly supplied, pushing the federal funds rate down to the floor. And the floor consisted jointly of IOER and the overnight RP rate. IOER was not a ceiling, it was just the top of the corridor. The way to think about it is think about IOER as the top of a shag carpet, and think about the overnight RP rate as the plywood under the padding. So the weight of these bloated excess reserves pushes the federal funds rate somewhere between the top of the shag carpet and the plywood. Now, the advantages uh, are. Uh, for those who like floor systems, that they allow for a simple monetary policy implementation without uh, operations through arbitrage, not scarcity. Uh, you now, in reality, things aren't so simple, but that's, again, another presentation. The other advantage is that they subsidize liquidity. This, I think, is a legitimate advantage. It reduces systemic risk in the payment system, and it supports maturity transformation by banks. So just like the discount window and FDIC insurance, you're providing these subsidized subsidies for maturity transformation uh, because Bank credit is useful. Now, the disadvantages are it increases the Fed's footprint. This disadvantage from my perspective. Uh, it has, uh, makes for high interest payments and a potential for losses. Bad optics, certainly. Uh, and also, as George Selgin has, has taught me, it, it allows the Fed to potentially be a piggy bank for Congress. Uh, it, no doubt a coincidence, but soon after the Fed recently said, well, you know what, we're going to use a floor system going forward, Congress came out with the Green New Deal that basically says, you don't need to tax people to pay for this, the Fed will pay for it. Now, uh, okay, enter the narrow bank. So the, uh, we've already discussed what the JNBI is. Basically, it takes deposit, uh, institutional deposits and invests in IOER. Uh, but, on, as we've discussed, on March 14th, the Fed issued a request for comment on issuing a request for comment on a policy to pay JNBIs less than IOER so that they aren't feasible. So the Fed also expressed similar concern as we said, about uh, PTIEs uh, that are for, created by one giant organization for its own cash management purposes. So that's another form of these things that the Fed's worried about. So, why does the Fed say it objects to JNPIs? And I just may say the reasons the Fed objects are kind of odd. Uh, and so, for example, it says JNBIs extend IOER to more institutions than Congress intended. Well, that was a feature of the overnight RP facility. That, uh, the JNBIs will facilitate destabilizing flight to quality flows, which is evidently a manageable risk for the overnight RP facility. JNBIs could get really big if IOER is above market rates. Well, Reg D says IOER is supposed to be at or below market rates. JNBIs will reduce the liquidity of the repo market, making uh, it hard for banks to liquefy their treasuries and making treasury pay more. Well, the Fed has issued regulation after regulation intending to increase, uh, reduce liquidity in the repo market. The NSFR, the ESLR, the Method 2G subsurcharge, and, and banks and others have said, this is going to reduce liquidity and it's going to make the treasury pay more. And the Fed said, that's not a big deal. You're making too much of this. Uh, and I won't go over the LIBOR issue, which is similarly suspect. 
So if any of you in this room have ever been in any kind of a relationship with any other human being, then you know that if somebody gives weird reasons for wanting something, it's probably because they want it for some other reason that they're really kind of uncomfortable saying. So why does the Fed really object to JNBIs, in, at least in my opinion? Well, so the Fed had thought, at least recently as a year ago, according to the, uh, an FRBNY report, that the amount of excess reserves consistent with the floor system was roughly $500 billion. So it could still be out on that flat part of the demand curve with just $500 billion of excess reserves, or maybe even below that. But, uh, and then in October of 2017, the Fed began to gradually shrink its balance sheet. Now, to the Fed's surprise and to everyone's surprise, last year with still more than uh, $1.5 trillion in excess reserves out there, the market, reserve, the market for reserves started to show some signs of tightness. The federal funds rate moved up towards IOER. Now, the costs of a floor system are proportional to its size. So the cost of the system seemed higher, and the, in particular, the optics of interest payments are awful. Now, all these big interest payments look like they're going to be a lot bigger, and that really looks horrible. But the optics of a bank started by a former Fed official, a leading advocate of a floor system, created only to, create, to collect IOER are especially awful. Uh, moreover, the Fed's eager for banks to reduce their demand for excess reserves so they can have a floor system that's smaller. And that means increasing the substitutability before, between treasuries and, and excess reserves. And the JNBI's demand for excess reserves is completely inelastic. So, OK, what, now in my view, what are the, actually the correct reasons to object to Monero Bank? Well, the cost of a floor system appear to be much higher than previously thought. The benefits appear lower than previously thought. The idea that the floor system provides some effortless way to conduct policy seems discredited, like, you know, we're, as we're talking about today. And the Fed doesn't appear comfortable with the idea that policy should be implemented through arbitrage. So the, really the only remaining benefit is that subsidizing liquidity reduces systemic risk in the payment system and supports the provision of credit by the bank, commercial banks. But those benefits only accrue when commercial banks hold the excess reserves in conjunction with providing payment services and making loans to businesses and households. So if the Fed's going to incur the high cost of providing subsidized excess reserves, then it should do so only for commercial banks. So I'm going to skip that last reason. Uh, uh, so, uh, but there's a simpler solution out there. I know George will agree with me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> if the costs of a floor system are higher and the benefits lower and complicated rules are required to accrue the remaining benefits, maybe the Fed should rethink its embrace of a floor system then to go back to conducting policy the way it did before the crisis. <clears throat> so in fact, the Fed is kind of edging into a corridor system now, and the JNB problem, in fact, may be moot. The federal funds rate is actually trading about 10 basis points above IOER, uh, and the JNB business model seems likely to be unprofitable now. Jamie can speak to that. But if the Fed wants to reduce systemic risk in the payment system, in the banking system, it should do what is the traditional ways of doing that. It should provide free collateralized day by credit. In fact, it started doing that in 2011. It started to pull away from it more recently with FBOs. And it should, could provide a standing treasury repo facility. So that's actually something they're thinking. Under a repo facility, it's actually like a streamlined, super safe, hopefully stigma-free discount window. Banks could know, well, we can hold treasuries. We don't have to hold excess reserves, because at the end of the day, if we want reserves, we can get them from the Fed. Uh, so thank you. Sorry to jump ahead of the line there, Andy. No, not at all. I'm not. Um, OK, so first of all, thanks to, to Paul for organizing this. Um, I think it's important. I wish this room was a, a huge auditorium yeah. <laughs> filled with reporters and congressional staff and maybe congressmen. Hopefully it will. Um, um, I just want to say also thanks to, to, um, to Ollie and Bert, whom I haven't met before. Bill, and I, Bill Nelson and I worked together. Um, you may have noticed this already in his presentation. Bill is brilliant at creating and using acronyms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he, 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 he was the master of this in 2008 and 9. Um, one of the ones you might remember, we called it alphabet soup, because um, there were so many of them floating around the Fed. Um, the most amazing one was AMLF, um, where the, of course, the, the, usually an acronym, each letter stands for a single word. In this case, the letter A actually stood for a whole phrase itself, <laughs> you know, based on a whole nother acronym. <laughs> so it's like, you know, stacking them up. Um, anyway, I think that, um, um, I think, as Paul or Ollie said earlier, um, I'm, a, I'm, a big, I'm a big picture person. So um, transparency and accountability are critical principles 
we, want, we talk all the time now, you see it all the time in the media and in discussions among academics, the importance of having a central bank that has operational independence. And operational the, the central bank is not an independent branch of government like the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court makes a decision and it stands until the Supreme Court changes its mind sometime later. That's not the Federal Reserve. Um, it's critical for the central bank, if it wants operational independence, to have transparency and accountability, which means that the public has to have broad confidence in all the kinds of decisions the central bank is making on monetary policy and on regulatory policy. I think that the Federal Reserve's record in this case is really atrocious. And you can quote me on that, it's atrocious. Um, and we, we could go through this, maybe Jamie will review some of it. Um, you, know, you can see it in the, in, in the public record now, that the record of the Fed is atrocious. And I think that the fact that the Federal Reserve has issued a, a proposed rulemaking based on uh, a interaction with a single you know, proposed um, bank is itself you know, not the way that regulations are supposed to work. Um, the, this, the, this is an important issue. I'm gonna talk about two reasons I think that's the case. Um, it's, a, it's an important issue for conservatives who are concerned about having a, um, a government agencies uh, that are systematic and transparent um, and, and where there's a level playing field. And, and I think it, it's a concern to progressives who care about having an economy and a financial system and a banking system that serve the broad public, ordinary consumers and small businesses. Um, those concerns are not evident to me in the way the Federal Reserve has been handling or is currently considering handling this, um, again, of concern both to conservatives and progressives. Um, what should happen, and I'll come back to this at the end of my remarks, is the Federal Reserve should have some open hearings on this and help the public and the Congress understand how important these issues are and how complex they are um, before it even considers starting to move forward. So maybe, I think, um, maybe Paul said, or, or Ollie said, this is, could be a two-year process. Um, I, I'd say maybe a five-year process might be plausible in some circumstance. Um, and how that interacts with the, the approval or moving forward of individual institutions is a separate legal question. I'll leave that aside. But uh, again, transparency and accountability. Okay, so um, the first point here is that in terms of the intent of Congress, I think was very clear in 1980. They passed legislation that said the Federal Reserve should treat all um, banks equally in terms of the fees that the Federal Reserve charges for its services. It's crystal clear, and I'm not a lawyer, but it's even crystal clear to me. I have it on my iPhone, I can read it if someone you know, <laughs> wants. The, it's a, you know, just in, in one paragraph of the statute, it's, it's crystal clear. The Federal Reserve's um, supposed to um, you know, completely, be completely fair and even-handed in, in the fees that it charges for its services. And that includes um, members of the Federal Reserve System and non-member banks. It includes nationally chartered banks and state chartered banks. It includes banks that have FDIC insurance and that don't have FDIC insurance. It includes banks that, where all of their um, assets are loans. And it includes banks, we'll call it retail deposits. Um, all, of their, um, uh, all of their liabilities are, 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 are a retail deposit. It includes banks that are, operate in the wholesale funding market. Um, and we, I guess that this, I mean, I, I really appreciated your comments, Bert, but, um, you know, the whole idea of the shadow banking system was regulatory arbitrage. And we could have said a long time ago, and maybe there was even in, in principle some people who would have wanted to do this to say, no, we're not going to have a shadow banking system. Everything has to, that's regulatory arbitrage. But instead, what happened was, at some point, the Federal Reserve started to embrace it and say, hey, let's open things up. We want institutions to have more flexibility and freedom to the extent possible in um, helping to serve the public. Um, and so banks were able to make decisions about how much of their funding is coming through retail versus wholesale. Now look, this was already happening by 1980. Congress did not say in that act um, oh, well, the Federal Reserve can charge different fees to banks depending on how much wholesale funding they have. 
They could have done that. They said, no, it has to be. And they could have said, hey, if a bank doesn't have FDIC insurance, well, that's going to hurt FDIC. But then the Fed can charge higher fees to try to discourage that type of banking behavior. No, it was supposed to be completely even-handed. Um, uh, now, look, when they adopted IBR in 2005, it was a point when the total amount of reserves, Bill, you said it, I think, was it? Um, 100 million, 250 million? One to two billion. Okay, sorry, one to two billion. Okay, just a tiny amount. Sorry, the interest on the, the let's call it two billion, the interest was, the interest rate at the time, let's say, was 5%. Um, you know, you, so you're talking about 50 to 100 million dollars in interest. It's a trivial amount. And almost all the reserves at the time were required reserves. So the, the, the Congress didn't put into the law to say, whether or not the Federal Reserve should charge this or pay the same interest. But I think a reasonable reading of congressional intent would have been to say that if the, if the, if the Congress had imagined a system where the Federal Reserve was going to have one or two trillion dollars in reserves, that they probably would have had serious congressional hearings and committees considering, do we want to give new regulatory authority to the Federal Reserve to start discriminating based on business models. And the reason I think and anyone here who's connected to the banking system should be very uneasy about this is this may start with the, what do you call it, the Jamie Narrow Bank idea? Um, um, but, um, and by the way, Narrow Banks is an old idea. It's not a Jamie idea. <laughs> it's, I think Irving Fisher and others um, have been talking about it you know, to, and introduced these ideas many, many you know, decades ago. Um, but it, it could start there, but then the Federal Reserve says, hey, you know what, we're going to pay a different IOER to banks depending on how much wholesale funding they have, or depending on the fraction of their re retail deposits that are FDIC insured. Um, and this could become a very, very intrusive tool once you open that door. Now, where would that lead, I suspect, just like it did in 1980? is eventually Congress would have hearings and say, no, Fed, you can't do that. You have to pay the same IOER to, to any state charter bank where the state regulatory authority, as they did with Jamie's bank, um, says this is a safe institution that's going to serve uh, the residents of our state and we're going to oversee it, um, is allowed to uh, register and get a master account at the Fed and get the Fed services, including um, holding reserves and receiving interest. And the Congress would established legislation to say, sorry, Fed, you got to be even-handed here. Does the Federal Reserve really want to go through that? That could take five, ten years. Usually the Federal Reserve is pretty conservative and cautious. They don't like to be overruled by Congress. And so I, I, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Federal Reserve taking notes on this, but I would say go back to your principals and warn them here that you're in for a lot of trouble if you go down this road. So just try to keep the, the playing field as level as possible. And again, I think this is a, a, a principle that conservatives in general would be strongly in favor of, um, as opposed to trying to use and fine tune the tools to say, no, we don't like this. We don't like the Jamie Narrow Bank, but, we, but it's okay for a bank to have 50% wholesale deposits or 80%, wholesale, just not 100%. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, now the other part of this, why should progressives be concerned about this? And I think this goes back to the history of the Federal Reserve was originally created as a, a bank to the bankers. The regional Federal Reserve banks are owned by the commercial banks in their district. And that, that was because of that original logic. We were under the gold standard, um, the, you know, the concerns about you know, financial stability and all the rest were totally different. The discount window was a key tool. Um, and, um, and so the idea of setting up the regional feds was that they would replace J.P. Morgan and providing emergency funding to the banks within their district. Um, uh, they set the reserve requirements of the banks. They were the bank to the bankers. But now the Federal Reserve Board you know, sets these rules. The Federal Reserve Board members are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. They're federal officials, and it's clear in the law the Federal Reserve Board has a mandate to serve the general public, not just the banks. In fact, not primarily the banks. The Federal Reserve Board is supposed to be serving the general public. Well, now we have to ask the question, what serves the public well? <laughs> 
Rod Garrett gave a presentation recently. I looked at his slides. I'm sorry he's not here. I'm sure that um, Paul probably maybe invited him and he just couldn't make it. Okay, but take a look at Rod Garrett's slides. He has, one, he has a picture taken from the St. Louis Fred of um, the interest rate paid on retail deposits that are not jumbo accounts. And it's a stunning, shocking picture because what you see in there is, um, and the way he made it, of course, it's the, the, um, the IOER against that retail deposit rate. Right? And it's about a trillion, there's about a trillion dollars in that sort of deposit today in the United States. Um, and as you might imagine, that deposit rate stays at zero as IOER and all the other short-term money market rates are going up and up and up to around 2.5% today. Okay, so um, these are real people here we're talking about, and we're not talking about necessarily the, the, the clients or, or investors in Jamie's bank. We're talking about ordinary American families who hold accounts at banks. And we're talking about small businesses who need those accounts at banks so they can have liquid funds to pay their employees and manage their, um, their business. And they're getting zero. And I don't think it's fair. And I think the Federal Reserve should be trying to actively figure out how can we make the banking system more competitive and push up the rates that ordinary Americans and small businesses receive on their small deposits. And I, I hope, actually, that, that if we call it the Jamie Nero Bank idea, I'm willing to give him the credit for the, at least the recent vintage of it, that that wouldn't stop with, with, with TNB. Imagine that um, AARP, you know, the American Association for Retired People, created a narrow bank for retired people. And retired people could just put their funds in there. Um, those funds would be totally safe because they'd all be held at the Fed. And any retired person could start receiving the same interest rate essentially as treasury bills and money market funds and, and all the things that wealthy people have access to. And, and, and would the Federal Reserve try to actively discourage that? Or just think of a small um, you know, startup in West Virginia that there's a lot of unbanked people in West Virginia and some other rural areas. And that organization said, look, we, we can't figure out, making loans is too complex. It's very difficult to make loans. There's a lot of risk considerations involved. Um, but we want to help people get into the banking system. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new organization where residents of West Virginia can now put their funds into our, we'll call it the safe bank, and the safe bank's going to hold all of those funds in a, in a Federal Reserve account so that whenever people want the funds, they can, have, they can have access to them. And those people will receive a fair, reasonable interest rate, something close to the Treasury rate. Wouldn't this make sense? So the direction the Federal Reserve is going is going to stop all that to a screeching halt. My hope when Jamie first told me about his idea was, wow, this hopefully is leading to a direction where the banking system and the financial system will start serving ordinary people and businesses better. And the fact that the Federal Reserve is trying to stop it is, I believe, at least in part, um, Bill was searching, well, what's really the reasons behind the scenes? I think part of the reason behind the scenes is because the Federal Reserve is still has very much a culture of being the bank to the bankers, and that culture needs to end. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you uh, all. Um, I would observe, I uh, am unfortunately old enough to have lived through the implementation of the Monetary Control Act. Uh, and the uh, requirement to pay, to charge the same rate, was, as I understood it at the time during the, the enactment of that legislation, a political expediency. Because the Fed was trying to expand reserves, which at that time were expensive to maintain to uh, thrift institutions and credit unions that were not members of the Federal Reserve System. And there was big concern on the part of those institutions. They were going to get access to Fed reserves as a quid pro quo sort of for the reserves, but they were afraid they weren't going to get them at the same rate. And so part of the political deal was this provision in there that said the rates are going to be the same. There is actually a back door to that about how you can charge non-members a bigger clearing balance if you want to. And, and I spent a lot of time 
looking at that for various reasons, for particular institutions at various times that some people at the Fed didn't like and thought they might punish by charging them greater clearing balances, which is sort of a deja vu of this, this issue. Uh, the statute does say that the distribution of these earnings to depository institutions can be one of the issues that the Fed writes rules on. So I think uh, Vice Chair Quarles' uh, response to Bert's question is probably right as a statutory matter. That doesn't answer the question about how you do this and how you make the distinctions, which I think people have pointed out here. And as but again, but they thought that it was a $50 million worth of interest per year that was going to be distributed, and giving the Federal Reserve a little bit of flexibility seemed very reasonable at the time. I just think that literally Congress had no con conception that where we might be in 2019. I, 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 think, that's, I think that's completely right. I was uh, surprised when the Federal Reserve solicited comment here because I thought it was the, the worst thing. The, normally, they would try to sweep this kind of thing under the rug and not tell people how much they're paying to the, to the big banks and actually to the big foreign banking organizations in particular. Uh, but here they are. I'd like to hear it. Where do you think, how do they get themselves out of this mess? One proposal is five years and hearings and, and so on. I, they, they've started a process. They can't, they're not going to pull that process back. Uh, I don't know that this is going to, anybody's got deep pockets that's going to lead to litigation on it. I don't know whether this is going to become a congressional issue. Reading the comments so far on the proposal, there are, only, there are no significant comments. It doesn't look like it's becoming a big controversial issue. But this is a, a potentially a very big issue. It talks about policy of what you do with government largesse. It talks about policy about how you conduct monetary policy. What's, what's the way out of this? Um, I'll just start with Bert and go down the line. I, well, just a, a couple of comments. First of all, I want to emphasize the transitory nature of, of excess uh, reserves. At some point in time, I believe the Fed will uh, shrink its, uh, its balance sheet and go back to, shall we say, a not only a normalization of interest rates, which I think has to be a, a byproduct of, uh, of shrinking the, the, the balance sheet, uh, but uh, just because of the interest rate distortions that are, that are taking place because of what effectively is a huge balance sheet. So I think it's important to keep in mind, excess, the, the substantial quantity of excess reserves that are there today might not be there two, three, five years from now. But the other thing, too, is that I have a problem with the, the safe bank idea because what you're then talking about doing is creating a new parallel retail banking system uh, in, in the country at a time when the banking industry is, uh, uh, is shrinking its, uh, its physical uh, uh, retail uh, footprint. And finally, I'd like to make this point. If you don't have capital requirements, it is possible for one of these banks to go bust, even though it has very safe assets. How can that happen? Through fraud. And you know, we're seeing this actually in a parallel basis in the cryptocurrency world. You have these custodians that are supposedly uh, holding safe assets, and you know what's happening? They're disappearing to who knows where. And so uh, safety and soundness sh uh, concerns about uh, 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 the P ties should not be just dismissed uh, out of hand because that, again, in turn raises the question of, number one, capital requirements, and number two, deposit insurance. In other words, you, you come in and, and the Federal Reserve Bank in New York had an unfortunate incident a couple of years ago where somebody came in that was pretending to be right? a yeah. foreign central bank and right. took their money out, mm -hmm. and somebody could come into a PTI uh, electronically and take their money out, only it's not the person who's supposed to take their money out. Yeah, I, again, <laughs> I, fraud should never be dismissed uh, as a, poss a real possibility in any kind of financial uh, situation, including uh, the PTIs. So I, I would echo uh, Bert's concern there that. Um, you know, the history is littered with, uh, with things that were supposed to be riskless, 
that turned out not to be riskless. And it, you know, it's amazing how frequently we, we recreate this. At a minimum, these, en <laughs> these entities should be required to hold operational capital, which is a substantial amount of capital. And in addition to fraud, there's the issue of, fee of uh, penalties. Uh, know your customer rules. Uh, really trip banks up all the time. It would be an issue for these narrow banks. Uh, so, uh, so the idea of this, was, this is totally riskless, that doesn't need to hold capital, should be setting off a red flag for everyone. Uh, how do they resolve this? As I said, uh, and I think that this is going to probably resolve itself, frankly, I hope. Uh, so the Fed was surprised by the very high level of excess reserves. Uh, I explain it as basically a bank is a big complicated entity. You have people in the bank who are saying, you know, this, this week we want to hold this quantity of excess reserves. They're regulatory compliance people. There's somebody else in the bank responding to price signals. But eventually those things kind of, kind of work together. So repo rates are very high. So someone in the bank is finally saying, hey, look, instead of holding those excess reserves, let's repo in treasuries and earn a bit more. They're, they're, it's higher than IOER. Uh, large institutions are actually making decisions. And so I think over time, but I think that it'll feel to the Fed like it's constantly bumping up against the steep part of the demand curve. But then I think that curve will, sleep, will keep moving down and, and the quantity of the Fed's uh, reserves will go down. But in order for that to happen, there have to be price signals that, that cause it to happen. And that means that market rates are going to be a little bit above IOER. And I think while the, during that very long period, and maybe eventually they'll come back to a point where they want to uh, go back out beyond that level, I, who knows. But, but during that long period, uh, I think that the narrow bank idea, will actually, that business model won't be profitable. How do you, how do you move to that? System. Does the does the Fed have to? Does this just happen in the market, or should the Fed step down the IOER rate? So um, it, it's, it's, that's not really the way it works. The Fed provides the reserves. It looks at market prices and it sets the IOER rate to to have market rates move to where their target is. So all the Fed needs to do is to continue to let excess reserves decline. Uh, it's already finding that it needs to pay IOER that's a little bit below its target in order for market rates to hit the target where uh, it's intending. Right now, the IOER is, uh, I think, 15 basis points, but it might be 10 basis points below the FOMC's uh, target. Uh, so uh, they're already doing it, is the answer. So you think it, 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 that the current practice evolves in that direction? I think they're already doing they're already They've already shrunk their balance sheet to the point where they're kind of a little bit out of a floor system. I, uh, market rates are a bit above IOER. I think that they'll be able to inch it further and further down, but it's already begun. So they do it by monetary policy. They do it by shrinking their balance sheet. They do it by shrinking their, their, their and, balance and, and sheet. Th th that's the key to keep in mind, is <laughs> that the reason that IOR, or excess reserves grew so much is because the Fed was buying in mm -hmm. so much in the way of uh, a broad range of maturities uh, of treasuries as, as well as GSE paper. Their intent there was to bring down the long end of the yield curve. The Fed succeeded in that regard, as one of my charts uh, shows. But kind of a byproduct of it that I don't think people really thought about too much at the time was the creation of uh, this vast quantity of excess reserves. And that, in turn, has led to uh, the PTI uh, proposal. If we ever get back to a point of a normalization of the yield curve, which will be a key to uh, shrinking the Fed balance sheet, then uh, excess reserves in the quantities we have today are just going to disappear. Isn't, They'll go back into the banking system. Isn't shrinking the balance sheet essentially constraining uh, monetary policy in a constraining mode? Well, it's how yeah. rates have been held uh, so low, particularly at the long end of the curve. And again, if you get a normalization of interest rates, that means the Fed is going to get out of the, effectively get out of the business of being a major investor in uh, Treasury securities and, uh, and GSE paper. What's a normal interest rate? Uh, whatever the market uh, sits in. <laughs> so pre-crisis, a normal corridor yeah. had the uh, target uh, 100 basis points, uh, the, the lending rate 100 basis points above, the, the, bar, the deposit rate 100 basis but, points but a, below. But a normalization is going to be where you have a, a, a steeper yield curve and the Fed is out of the business of trying to directly influence long-term rates, uh, which it uh, did in the, in the aftermath of the crisis. And also, this is somewhat similar to what happened after World War II before the, the, the so-called Treasury Accord was, uh, uh, was, was reached. And so that's the, the central policy question, or the basic policy question is, when will the Fed get out of the business of trying to uh, hold down long-term rates? So, so to answer your question, so uh, 
If the Fed was, uh, if the if ability of the Fed to pay IOER was eliminated while it had such a big balance sheet, that would certainly constrain its ability to conduct monetary policy. But shrinking its balance sheet does not it limit its ability to conduct monetary policy. It used to conduct policy with only one to two billion dollars in excess reserves. I, but at the short there, end of the curve. So right now, it's it's no longer attempting to manipulate the long end through its holdings of maturity, long maturity securities. It's it's it really. I, I mean, that was certainly what what the QE was about. I have to totally agree. Uh, but but it's but it's said right, it, currently its target is overnight rates, and that's really what it's worried about. It will it will be able to hit that target with uh, a low quantity of excess reserves, not rather than a high, uh, just as it did before. Now currency has grown. Uh, the balance sheet's bigger, mm -hmm. uh, but the, what we're, the issue is the quantity of excess reserves. So just a few points. One, um, last Wednesday, the Federal Reserve began the process of tapering off its shrinking. Right. It's kind of an odd concept. <laughs> <laughs> tapering the shrinking. It's a reverse <laughs> um, But anyway, so in the plan, um, pretty clearly now, is that they're going to stop shrinking the balance sheet as of September. So when Bill says, well, if this would just continue for a while longer, we could kind of, and they were talking about it that way, of, well, let's see how far we can take this, maybe all the way back down to 500 billion or even less. They've now truncated that process. So um, I'm actually suspect we, we may never know, because now that the Fed's decided that, it'll probably just stick with that for years. Th that, that'll happen, they'll truncate the policy until they change their mind again, or they're under new Oh, well, pressure. that's true. Of course, that can, me, nothing that is can cast always in happen. Concrete. Well, um, to be clear, I guess so, the but the so but let's leave that. It's a little bit in the weeds. The 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 question about um, um, narrow banks um, and what capital they should have, I think, is a good question. But it seems like in the system, in the banking system we have now, there's a state chartering agency, and we give them authority to decide what they think they need to protect the residents of their state. Um, and sometimes banks do go under, and if if, if, if um, something went wrong with a, a uh, what was it, a JNBI, um, and the residents uh, of, of that state were hurt because they didn't have any FDIC insurance, um, maybe there's an outcry and maybe that state regulator gets fired or whatever. <laughs> that's accountability. Okay, we could say, well, look, we, maybe state chartered agencies, uh, that's ancient history, we should move into something where everything is federally chartered and where there's a single federal regulator. I'm not sure everyone in the room wants to go in that direction either. Um, but again, in the system we have now already, it's the case that the state charting agency, um, in a case like this, um, would, would be responsible for deciding how much capital the organization should have. Okay, the last point. Um, you know, you said, well, is this really a good time to be um, allowing or, um, and I would even say, it, try to encourage um, narrow banks? Um, given all the other changes happening in the bank system. Um, you know, we could say the same thing about the switch from horses to cars or the switch from <laughs> telephones to, to, uh, to we're, we're going to go through this now with, with uh, 5G. Right? We're, we're in a world, and the banks are going to have to change a lot of their parts of their business model anyway. And the retail deposits that we're talking about here that I'm concerned with for ordinary people is a trillion dollars. It's a pretty small fraction of the bigger picture. If that trillion dollars did move into what we'll call narrow banks for the moment, and all those people got interest at a fair rate, we're talking about $25 billion. And it, these are ordinary families and small businesses. I just don't see why we should encourage a banking system and try to protect <laughs> regulatory costs for big banks by imposing a $25 tax on ordinary families and, and businesses. Well, and so, well, will I be able to open a, uh, a my personal checking account at a PTI? Uh, uh, in my in the world that I you I, I think you asked Ollie what direction yeah. should we go? Yes. <laughs> what I would like to see the Federal Reserve do, and I've said this in other public remarks. I said it on Friday at, at a Hoover Institution conference. The Federal Reserve should be actively. It should not just be a banker to the banks. It should be actively trying to encourage a competitive financial system that works well for ordinary families and small businesses, and it should be encouraging the startup of new financial institutions that serve if, those if, kind of if, people. The answer is no. Just a, we're we're, we're going to run out of time here, but <laughs> Sorry. let me, let me add can, can I just make one, one more, interject yeah, one bit of history, and that is the idea of having uninsured accounts for retail investors. I'm old enough to remember very well the uh, the in crises in the '80s.
with when the Ohio Deposit Insurance Fund went bust, and then a couple of weeks later, the Maryland Fund went bust. And these were state chartered uh, uh, insurance plans for state chartered banks, totally outside the federal system. Well, guess what? When those problems developed, they came up to the federal level immediately, and uh, there were all kinds of congressional hearings and so forth. The idea that in this day and age, we're going to have uninsured retail banks operating, I think, is just a political non-starter. Well, in, in both of those cases, the states bailed them out. Um, I, spent a but, month, but, I spent a month in Ohio during that case. <laughs> The, does, it, does any of the answer change if the person running the, the narrow retail bank is named Apple or Amazon or Google? We'll leave it. You, was that, <laughs> that, was a, that was a rhetorical question. That was a rhetorical question. Yeah, okay. I don't but want a critical to one. Well, it's not because in the reg, it specifically calls out the fact that they're worried about uh, large financial institutions or large non-financial institutions creating narrow banks to do their own right. cash management. So that would take only the deposits of that institution and invest it. Well, but if Apple not or, or, or it could Amazon be Apple, might but for want to take, all, take all, everybody from Amazon Prime and put them in their narrow Well, that's fine, but, it's, but, it's, <laughs> but the concerns are different than that. You could also have Apple do it for its own cash management purposes. The only depositor would be Apple. We, out, of, out, of, out of this panel, we have no consensus on these <laughs> issues. I, it will be interesting to see where the Fed winds up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Second panel could come to the stage. We have a short two-minute intermission while we change name tags, so each of us can actually remember who we are. You know, when you get so, I, I will entertain you with a short story uh, while we're while we're changing here. So, when the AEI first put out the public announcement of this event, uh, somebody responded to the AEI events inbox and and with an email that said. I cannot believe that in 2019 you're hosting an event where every panelist is a male. This is just, this is just uncalled for. And um, so I was talking to uh, to an economist colleague here, Mark Perry, who said, "Yeah, there's a movement out there now to to shame people who have all male panels, and there's a name for it. There's a name for it. They call them mantles, mantles." So if there's a name for all male panels, and it's called a mammal, mantle, I think there should be a name for all female panels. And, and I kind of did my scholarly research, and I, and I, and I found an example of it, and it's called, it's called The View. And it's on, it's on every day. So that's my little story. But anyway, uh, just to set the record straight, there were, uh, there were female economists and female captains of the banking industry invited to participate on the panels today, unfortunately. They were all busy and could not make it. So um, we uh, did make an attempt. Uh, but you can't, you can't get people to come who won't accept your invitation. So the second panel is on financial stability this morning. Uh, part of the Fed's uh, proposed an, uh, uh, announcement of a pro potentially proposed rulemaking, as, as uh, Ali um, corrected me, ANPR, not an NPR, was about financial stability issues raised by this notion of a narrow bank. And to, to cut to the chase, the, the story is, uh, if we ever get another financial crisis, these, these narrow banks uh, you know, may be so safe, because they only invest in Federal Reserve deposits, that people might panic and pull their money out of normally regulated banks and pour their money into narrow banks. And we might have this, this huge liquidity crisis where the narrow banks become the safest of all institutions, and, and, and their existence destabilizes the, the regulatory banking system. So, so I guess uh, we savers, uh, in, in terms of what Andy Levin was saying, we have to bear the cost of close to zero rates on our deposits so that next time the regulators miss the, the, the brewing financial crisis, that they, they can't, they, they, won't, they won't be uh, imperiled with this, this run to, to narrow banks. So the second panel is going to talk about this issue. And um, we're going to lead off with Jerry Dwyer. Jerry is a professor at Clemson University. Um, he's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Uh, and he 
has written many scholarly articles over the years that have been published in leading academic journals and, and Federal Reserve publications. He's uh, very active in the Society of Nonlinear Dynamics and Econometrics, and he was their president, served as their president. And he was, uh, for many years, at the Federal Reserve, a vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Uh, speaking second will be George Selgin, who is a senior fellow and director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute, and a, he looks really young, but if you can believe it, he's a retired professor from the University of Georgia. I don't, George, how'd you do that so young? His, <laughs> his research covers a broad range of topics. He writes all the time and has blogs and very, very many thoughtful pieces. He's also widely published in academic uh, and in uh, more popular outlets. Uh, uh, he's taught at a number of other universities in his scholarly career, and he's generally a very thoughtful and smart guy. And last but not least, uh, I promised Jamie he could bat uh, clean up so that he uh, since he has actually the most at stake in all these arguments. He is an economist, uh, formerly from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, in fact, the director of research there. But he is now CEO and chairman of the board of the Narrow Bank USA, or I think what we were calling the JMI, whatever it is, the Jamie Narrow Bank. But it's the Narrow Bank USA. It's a Connecticut chartered bank whose objective is to provide high-yielding safe deposits to institutional investors. It is a narrow bank. Um, Jamie's been working on this for since he retired from the Federal Reserve, and um, he's got he's got a lot of a lot of thought put into this process. and And we'll hear from Jamie last. So uh, the floor is yours, Jerry. Okay. Does is this the this work the slides? It should. Yeah. There we go. Actually, I titled this Very Narrow Banks because Jamie's bank really is narrower than the traditional idea of narrow banks. I mean, the idea of narrow banks has been around for a long time and it's been a standard kind of proposal is, is to have institutions that instead of making relatively risky <coughs> loans and engaging in all these risky activities, they just buy treasury securities or maybe even better, treasury bills. Um, and so the probability of loss is related to price risk on treasury bills, which is not very big, and that's basically the risk. Jamie's bank is narrower than that because they just hold reserves at the Federal Reserve, um, which is, has no price risk and, in fact, arguably is a better security than treasury bills because um, it's very liquid. There's no transactions costs. Um, it's hard to beat. So what are the risks due to narrow banks? This is the proposed, it's not a proposed rule actually, it's, you said a proposed, it's a proposal of maybe may, talking about a rule. Um, and so there are four parts to this, and I'm gonna talk about each part of it. Um, avoiding regulatory costs and capital requirements, complicate monetary policy impl implementation, change intermediation in ways that are hard to anticipate and adverse effects on financial stability. Clearly, this is an awful idea. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna say much about avoiding regulatory costs and capital requirements, because to be honest, it's ridiculous. Um, why is it ridiculous? Because if you don't have risks, then there's nothing to regulate. There's no costs on other people. There is fraud, that's an issue, all right, for all financial institutions uh, and exchanges and all kinds of things. Um, but on the other hand, um, macroprudential risk associated with deposits at the Federal Reserve, only if you think the Federal Reserve is gonna collapse um, and suddenly can't just write up more reserves. So, it, they should avoid the regulatory costs. Now, the only way you can really justify this is if you think about it this way, is, well, maybe they're just paying off the banks for having all this regulation, and that's the point of having interest on excess reserves. From an economic standpoint, that's a very bizarre idea. The whole point of having regulation is to make the institutions bear the costs of their own activities <laughs> 
or not engage in certain activities that cause excessive <coughs> costs on other people. You don't pay people to avoid regulation that's supposed to be a good idea. If the regulations are bad ideas, do away with them. That's the way to deal with that. Okay. Um, I want to mention in passing, this is an economic aspect of this too, is, is, and this has come up talking to Paul even in the past, is so what's the subsidy associated with interest on excess reserves? All right. As some people mentioned, I'm old enough to remember there's a whole literature on required reserves and the fact that it's a tax. When you pay zero interest on, on reserves, the tax is equal to the difference between the risk-free interest rate and the interest rate of zero that the banks receive. And that's the tax. Removing a tax is not a subsidy. You know, that'd be like saying, well, if your income taxes are lowered, you're getting a subsidy. No, you're getting a lower tax, all right? So the interest on reserves is primarily the removal of a tax that banks have been bearing in the past. And now they're not, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. Now there is a subsidy possible, right. and this is where the narrow bank comes in, which is that if the interest rate on excess reserves is above the interest rate that's available to other people, then the institutions receiving that interest rate clearly are getting a subsidy, and it's equal to the difference not the level, okay? So this is sort of the regulatory aspect of it and the subsidy aspect of it because the subsidy question comes up all the time and people say, oh, it's just a big subsidy because they're getting checks. No, what they're doing is, is they're getting compensated for something, a tax that they otherwise would have to bear. Um, so I want to talk about the Fed's proposal. Um, this is actually, if you read it, it's actually very disappointing for somebody who worked at the Federal Reserve for almost 20 years at one time and another at Federal Reserve banks. Um, there are 51 coulds in this. It could do this, it could do that, you know. When people use that word a lot to me, what I say to them is, you know, you know what could happen? An asteroid could hit the Earth tomorrow and, the, and all life will be extinguished. It could happen. It's not impossible, it's just virtually zero probability, all right? And so there's a lot of coulds in here um, when you try to think about it all. So, so monetary policy, the first could it has is, is it could affect the plan, Fed's plans to reduce its balance sheet. Wait, the Fed just said they don't want to reduce their balance sheet. All right, they're not talking to themselves. Now there is an issue actually that Bill Nesson alluded to, which is the Fed funds rate currently is trading above the interest rate on excess reserves, which raises a question that I actually don't know the answer to about what's going on and who's collecting that interest rate. Um, and that's very interesting. That has, a lot, that has some implications related to the size of the balance sheet. Um, but the Fed has made it clear, very clear they don't want to reduce the size of the balance sheet, and it wouldn't be surprising if they increased it, actually. Um, then the second one is, well, it could have spillover effects in other markets. That is that basically the, basically the issue is the following, or can make it more difficult for the Fed to control short-term interest rates. And basically the issue is the following is, so, we have this interest rate on excess reserves, <coughs> all right? I'm talking about the way they've been doing it at least up until the last couple weeks. And they set the interest rate on excess reserves, and that's the interest rate banks receive on their excess reserves and required reserves. And then a lot of other interest rates, for example, very short-term treasuries actually trade below that rate. All right, that's the rate that's available to other institutions. And then it's passed through markets to other things. Um, the Fed, even in this proposal, talks about the interest rate on federal funds, at least until the last couple of weeks. The interest rate on federal funds is one of the most in uninteresting interest rates available in financial markets. It's the interest rate that's received by, as was discussed in the first panel, 
GSEs and federal home loan banks on their deposits at the Federal Reserve because the Fed is not allowed to pay them interest on their reserves. And so they lend it to banks and then they split the gains. And that's what the federal funds market has been for years. I mean, so it's completely uninteresting. Um, the only reason the Fed talks about it is because, and Paul talked, mentioned this, the only reason the Fed talks about it is, is because, well, the FOMC sets the interest rate on federal funds. The board sets the interest rate on excess reserves. Truthfully, for the last eight or nine years, they could have just stopped the FOMC meeting altogether. It's a waste of time and effort and just have the board decide what the interest rate is gonna be on excess reserves and that's that. Now, for political reasons, they don't wanna do that. Um, they probably don't really, I mean, in a way they do, but they don't really wanna cut the presidents out completely or at least they don't wanna to appear to be. Um, and so, the, this even this talks about it. But basically, the interest rate that matters for monetary policy is the interest rate on excess reserves. Me, perhaps naively, it seems to me like if something happens that makes that interest rate minus small transactions costs available to everybody, then it gets transmitted more broadly through the economy. There's less slippage. And you can say, well, it's large institutions getting it. Yeah, but the large institutions we're talking about are money market funds. You know, and you can say, well, not everybody has $3,000, but there are money market funds where you only have to have $1,000 to get in. And for that matter, actually, there are banks that are providing online savings accounts with interest rates. It's checking accounts that are really horrible interest rates, of course. I get one one hundredth of a percent, um, which is effectively zero. And so I think the argument can be made, and I think it's the correct one, that doing away with this slippage between rates like treasuries and the interest rate on excess reserves would actually make monetary policy operating by setting the interest rate on excess reserves more effective, make it affect interest rates more broadly and more predictably because you don't have this slippage. That is, it's not the case that there's a constant difference between the interest rate on treasury bills <coughs> and the interest rate on excess reserves. It's not the case that there's a constant difference even between the interest rate on federal funds, let alone other short-term interest rates. And so I think, I think the correct conclusion is no, it, it'll have different effects, not could. What are risks do, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Financial intermediation, they use this PTIEs, and then they don't have a dash between the P and the T so that they can make this acronym because otherwise they'd be PIEs. Um, <laughs> which sounds like a good thing. You know, and basically here what they're saying is, is well, it's gonna raise interest rates on other instruments. If they don't want interest rates on other instruments to go up, it's easy. Lower the interest rate on excess reserves. It's that simple. It, you know, and, and the truth of the matter is, this is straightforward economics. It's sort of natural to think, oh, but banks are collecting all these deposits and they're paying very little interest and so they're gonna, pay, they're gonna charge less interest on their loans uh, backwards. Why is it backwards? Because if they pay a low interest rate on their deposits, they have fewer deposits. If they have fewer deposits, they make fewer loans. If they make fewer loans, there's less supply. Given the demand, the interest rate is higher. And so the effect on interest rates is the opposite. That is, to the extent that it actually raises deposits and raises, raises people's savings, it's gonna lower interest rates on things like loans. No, it may raise interest rates on loans from banks because there's fewer deposits in banks, but then there's going to be more funds available elsewhere. Um, you know. So how about financial stability? This one I think is really, this is quoted. It's really quite bizarre. Could re significantly reduce financial stability by providing, I mean, I, I really didn't want to do this this way, but, it, but it, I can't avoid it. I don't mean just this, but just some of this discussion. 
could significantly reduce financial stability by providing a nearly unlimited supply of very attractive safe haven assets during periods of financial market stress. Okay, so we're going to get a bigger supply of relatively low-risk assets in a, in a crisis. Oh, that's so horrible. It's what the Fed is supposed to be doing. And effectively, they can do that. That is, what would happen? All right, what they're talking about happening is really the following. That people say, oh, I'm worried about the funds in the bank. I'm going to deposit it in a money market fund that's only depositing in a narrow bank. And that way, I know my money is perfectly safe. And so you're going to get an outflow of deposits and an inflow into these reserves. That's actually a good thing. The reason it's a good thing is because the Fed can turn around and lend. The bank obviously has an outflow of deposits. The Fed can lend reserves to the bank to compensate it for that. That's, and that undoes that. But the advantage is, is if you think about you know, classic bank runs were runs from deposits into cash. And one of the big issues was is that you have this whole multiple expansion of deposits and cash is cash. Well, reserves are reserves. And so basically, the flow into reserves is actually going to create the additional assets at the Fed that make it possible for them to turn around and make the loans. And so it's going to provide very attractive safe haven assets and actually guarantee that the Fed's going to do it, as opposed to they have to think about it. Um, which seems like a pretty good thing. This is one version of what's going on. Is Part of what's going on is, is it's like, oh, well, it could do this, it could do that, it could do this other thing, it could do all kinds of terrible things. If you want stability, here's stability. We don't have stability in that sense. What we're looking for is things to be reasonably stable, not that stable. I'm actually, part of my research is on Bitcoin, actually, and this is an issue that arises in this context, is part of what's going on here is, is that this narrow bank is an innovation. It's a different kind of institution than the Fed is used to dealing with, or bank regulators in general, for a very long time. So it's a very particular kind of institution. The Fed's basically saying, well, we don't know what the effects of this are going to be, so we want to say no. I mean, that is what's going on. We're not sure. They're not saying, oh, it's obviously horrible. They're saying, we're not sure, and it could be bad. And it could be. It's hard to see, but suppose it could be. Then we want to say no, because we don't want messy stuff. And we don't want things that we can't really completely predict and control. Um, and that's really a bad thing, actually, in general and in this context. Thank you. George. Thank you. Well, one of the uh, advantages of going this late in the program is that there are a lot of things I don't have to cover because so much information, and especially background information, has been uh, provided. The disadvantage is that, as the other speakers spoke, I've had to cross off a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, I find myself uh, in agreement with so much uh, that has been said, and uh, therefore, there's nothing for me to add to much of it. Still, I do have a few things to say, thank goodness. Um, I wanted to start by pointing out something that perhaps is also now obvious to everyone, which is that the TNB and, uh, and other uh, p, p ties, which I suspect if the Fed uses this acronym, it'll pronounce it PITIES, <laughs> uh, uh, aren't, uh, aren't about, aren't, uh, they're not designed, the purpose here is neither to contribute uh, uh, to or detract from financial stability or safety. That's not the purpose. And in particular, the, these uh, pities or pties, they're not designed to prevent uh, Mary Poppins style or uh, uh, it's a wonderful lifestyle bank runs in the sense that, as has been mentioned, they're not, uh, they're not uh, taking deposits from uh, um, many ordinary folks uh, the, 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 for the rel relatively well-to-do. So there'll still be plenty of ordinary bank deposits out there, and those can be uh, run upon. Uh, 
the, 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 so, so we should not be thinking about it as a narrow banking uh, possibility in that uh, old-fashioned sense and as contributing to bank stability in that way. Uh, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have possible implications for financial stability. I want to start addressing those by asking whether there are some other ways in which uh, uh, pities or pties could contribute to financial stability. Um, and, uh, and I think the answer is it's unlikely to make much of a, they're un unlikely to make much of a positive contributions through any channel. Uh, and the reason I say that is that the main, the most obvious effect of allowing pities I like that pronunciation too. Uh, we mustn't assume that it reflects any prejudice on my part, uh, but uh, 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 it's easier to say. Uh, the main effect is that the money market funds uh, uh, st swap uh, uh, their treasury holdings for reserves that are backed by treasury securities and, right now, mortgage-based securities. In a sense, in essence, they let the Fed become their portfolio manager. They dispense with all the costs involved of having to do all that work. Uh, they, they op their operating costs fall. And, as something I'll emphasize later, at least as the proposal was intended to work under those original circumstances, they actually can offer a higher yield than they would have been able to do if they did, did it all themselves, which is a point I'm going to emphasize more later on. Uh, so that's one effect. Um, the, the, uh, uh, and so, and that's fine, but as far as safety is concerned, it doesn't affect the safety of the, the money market funds in, an, in a, all, all that much, just minor change, if any. Uh, as for the commercial banks, of course, they're likely, as has been mentioned a few times, to face some disintermediation as a result of more vigorous competition with, not with money market funds as such, but uh, with narrow banks that are money market funds one step removed. Um, I don't think that, uh, that uh, uh, this, this is necessarily a problem for financial crises. It's a problem for the banking system, for its appeal, the co commercial bank's ability to compete in the long run. And uh, that's an issue, but I don't see it as a cyclical issue. It's a, it's a one-time kind of competitive issue, rather like the issue the commercial banks faced back when money market funds were first introduced. Uh, you'd have more of the same kind of competition and disintermediation. I should be, I should be said that, though, that uh, I don't think that there's a contribution to financial stability through this disintermediation. There might be if commercial banks were dangerously illiquid, because then they're having less commercial bank deposits means there are fewer opportunities for runs on commercial banks now that more people are putting their money into narrow banks. When I say commercial, I mean ordinary commercial. But with the new liquidity coverage ratios and other devices for dramatically enhancing uh, ordinary bank uh, liquidity. I don't see the big shift out of ordinary banks into narrow banks should it occur as making the uh, banking system as a whole all that much more safe. So then the question is, uh, might the pities detract in important ways from uh, financial stability? And um, uh, I think that the answer there is it's possible, but not that likely. Uh, as we've seen, uh, the overall liquidity of the financial system isn't going to be that much different uh, with the spread of, of pities than it would be before. There is some operational risk that has been mentioned. This is the fraud risk that could be uh, important, uh, but I don't think that that's uh, uh, normally what we consider to be uh, a, fin a, a financial stability issue. It's an issue of trying to create careful, hack-proof uh, operating systems, and that's a big challenge. Disintermediation, again, is a possibility, perhaps a probability, to, to some extent, presumably, a disintermediation of ordinary banks would occur, but I think I would call this a, sec a secular problem rather than a cyclical one. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, 
That leaves the issue of monetary control, which uh, if it were badly impaired, uh, then of course that could itself be a problem for stability if the Fed can't uh, regulate rates the way it wants to, and it could be a problem in other ways. But as other speakers have mentioned, I think here the problem, as from the Fed's point of view, the, the claim that there'd be a problem with monetary control if we allowed pities to uh, enter freely, it's a cosmetic problem. It's a cosmetic problem given the way the present system is set up because there's a target range and the Fed likes to see the actual Fed funds, effective Fed funds rate fall near the middle of that range rather than at the top. But the only reason the Fed prefers it to look that way now is because they moved the goalposts, so to speak, to create this range because when the system was first set up, it didn't do what they then hoped it would do, which was to have the Fed funds rate be regulated by the interest rate on the excess reserves. So in fact, the system with the narrow banks in added would look more like it was originally supposed to look. So it might be said that it's technically superior, if not cosmetically so much to the Fed's current liking. So I don't see an issue with monetary control. I think the big issue though, and there is a big issue in my opinion with, with the pities, uh, the real problem is the, the Fed's expanded a footprint, uh, the, the bigger need for excess reserves that it would involve, and frankly, the Fed becoming the money market. It's already a much bigger part of the short-term money market than it was before, and this would make it a still bigger part. I don't think, and this is in response to Jerry's point, it's true as of uh, February, the Fed said, well, we're not going to shrink our balance sheet anymore uh, after September, but I think that decision is a mistake, and I think that the Fed could change its mind, but it'll be harder for it to do so if it also has a, a much a big demand for reserves coming from a new set of uh, narrow banks. So I think that we don't want to allow something to happen that, for those of us who'd rather see this balance sheet go on shrinking, is going to make it harder for the Fed to uh, reconsider its decision to continue uh, getting uh, uh, to a smaller balance sheet. And, and the reason I think a, a bigger balance sheet is dangerous is because it does involve subsidies of various kinds uh, that uh, are distortive. Uh, and uh, it's not the case in general that the interest rate on excess reserve doesn't involve any subsidy at all. It does, as again has been mentioned on a few occasions, when that interest rate exceeds the federal funds rate. More generally, it involves subsidies when the interest, because the interest rate on excess reserves isn't necessarily the same as the yield and the Fed's underlying portfolio. And here you can think about it very simply. What's the motivation for the narrow bank and other proposals? That a money market fund can make more money letting the Fed uh, pay uh, holding deposits at the Fed that, than by forming its own portfolio of various treasury securities. Now, how can that be? Well, because the Fed is not paying a rate of interest that reflects the, its own portfolio, but is paying more, particularly if you adjust for risk, right? And that's where the profit is coming from. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for money market funds to prefer holding bank uh, reserves or holding reserve balances at the Fed than uh, just doing what they normally do. So, um, and that, of course, means that as, as you have a, a big balance sheet, precisely in those occasions when it's most attractive for narrow banks to get involved in uh, 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 holding Federal Reserve balances, that is w precisely when it's most attractive for money market funds to put deposits in a narrow bank. Those are the occasions when the distortions are the greatest, where these implicit subsidies uh, uh, involved in those interest payments are the greatest, and those subsidies come out ultimately of, uh, they're, 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 they, they reflect to some extent, risks that are being placed not on the bondholders or on the banks, but on the general public through fluctuating, through uh, fluctuating uh, treasury remittances and uh, and so on. So um, I uh, think that uh, the answer here isn't 
for the Fed to discriminate against the narrow bank or any other like proposals. I don't like the idea of the uh, legislation or rules that it's contemplating. Uh, but I really think that the best solution is the same one that Bill has emphasized, that we should make the whole issue moot uh, by having the Fed reconsider the corridor system and the large balance sheet it requires and the subsidies that it allows and so on. Not, to, not that it should get rid of interest payments on reserves, but that it should use them as was it originally contemplated by the 2006 uh, Act to simply compensate banks for a tax on reserves, but not to reward other kinds of financial institutions with opportunities to earn more than they can earn by doing their own investing directly in whatever portfolios they uh, manage to come up with. So I say the real solution is to fight for the Fed to return to a corridor operating system, which it can, can do by continuing to unwind its balance sheet, by not using the, the premium on Fed funds as an excuse for not shrinking its balance sheet further because, again, as Bill said, that premium is just a sign that the Fed's moving towards a corridor system. Great, let it keep doing so. When it gets there, things will settle down. And, um, and, and, and then money market funds can go back to just being plain old money market funds where there's no incentive for them to be banks. And, and banks, in turn, can go on continuing to be banks without having to worry about uh, money market funds disguised as banks. Thanks. Jamie? Thanks, Paul. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you again, Paul, and the AEI for sponsoring this. I think this is a very important issue. I look forward to having women involved in the discussion. <laughs> Me too. The forward. And I've really appreciated uh, all the ideas that have been put forth by Bert and Ollie, Andy, Bill, Jerry, George, and you, Paul. Uh, thanks so much. I, I And uh, <laughs> like George was saying, um, Hearing all these ideas, have, you know, my head is swimming with a lot of the ideas that have been uh, uh, pointed out. So I would like to respond to a few of them and, and then discuss financial stability directly, which uh, I take it as my charge. Uh, first of all, this definition of what are we talking about. Uh, I, of course, prefer the name narrow banks. And as Jerry pointed out, the narrow bank uh, that I'm involved with, TNB USA Incorporated, is a very narrow bank. And uh, it... In answer to Ali, we are uh, writing, my colleagues and I are writing a, a comment letter to the Fed on its ANPR. We hope to uh, submit that uh, uh, later on this week or, or very early next week. And in that, we define narrow banks as depository institutions, entities, or facilities whose main purpose is to offer non-banks overnight investments that are directly or indirectly fully backed by central bank liabilities. So. That definition, we believe, is, is a much better definition than uh, what the Fed has offered. And certainly, we believe narrow bank is a much better name than this acronym. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But the point of that is, of course, as uh, Bill was pointing out, the Federal Reserve's overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility and its foreign repo pool for foreign central banks are narrow banks. Uh, and so we've been living in a narrow bank world for several years, at least since 19, uh, 2014. And from that, we can you know, answer many of these questions, these 51 coulds. Uh, we already know how these things will work. And uh, a bit on the, the Federal Reserve's name, pass-through investment entities. And if you read the ANPR, uh, you wonder why are they focusing on an outcome of an economic uh, you know, system which pass through would result, one hopes, from good competition, rather than describing the underlying nature of the institutions that they're attempting to target. And I think that the, uh, the focus is that somehow pass through is a bad thing and pass to should be the, the common thing. And of course, interest on reserves has been passed to banks uh, in all too great an amount as. Jerry correctly defines what the subsidy is. The subsidy involved in the payment of interest on reserves is the difference between what banks earn and what other parties, what is available to other parties. And uh, Andy pointed out that over a trillion dollars in bank deposits, to deposits today earn zero interest rate. So that those banks are simply pocketing interest on reserves. That is a subsidy. And we should fight against that subsidy. Uh, 
George and Bill have talked about, you know, it's a bad thing that the subsidy, they should cut back on the size of the Fed's balance sheet. I'd like to point out that the issue we're discussing today really has very little to do with the size of the Fed's balance sheet. So in, in that sense, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with Bill and George. It has to do with the payment of interest on reserves. So those are two very different things. It is true that the size of the Fed's balance sheet uh, it grew through its large-scale asset purchase program and through its uh, extraordinary credit uh, uh, easing, uh, as described by Chairman Bernanke in 2012. And interest on reserves helped them uh, manage the financing of that, as, as uh, Bert pointed out. However, uh, interest on reserves itself does not require necessarily a large balance sheet, and that's something I'll come back to. And I'll come back to another point that Jerry made, which I think is absolutely crucial with regard to the implementation of monetary policy. Jerry said there's too much slippage in these rates. You know, you pay one rate up here, interest on reserves. Other people down here are getting uh, overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility rate. The foreign central banks are getting a rate even above the interest rate on reserves at some times. Uh, you know, there are rates for treasury securities and so on. It would be better if we could reduce the dispersion of short-term interest rates, and that's really the impetus behind the narrow bank, is to reduce the dispersion in, in short-term interest rates, the shortest-term interest rates, and that would help monetary policy. We believe, you know, the narrow bank is fully consistent with the uh, implementation of monetary policy. And one of the interesting things that we'll talk about in our comment is uh, there were various uh, experiments done by the Federal Reserve in uh, December 2014 on using, changing the rate of interest on its narrow bank, the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility. And what that showed, and uh, there are speeches on this by the Federal Reserve SOMA manager, Simon Potter, is that... Um, what happened when they raised the rate on the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility relative to the interest on excess reserves is that banks paid higher rates to these large depositors, the federal home loan banks and money market mutual funds and others. They did not change the quantity of borrowing. So what this suggests, and this is the best evidence we have, is that narrow banks would likely change bank interest rates. It wouldn't necessarily disintermediate banks by any stretch of the imagination. David Andofado at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has a nice paper on these uh, central bank digital currencies. This is a theoretical paper. But in that paper, banks uh, are imperfectly competitive in the deposit market. And in that paper, what happens when there's a competition from a central bank digital currency, and in this case, this would apply for narrow banks as well, is that banks raise their deposit rates. And because they raise their deposit rates, again, as Jerry instructed us, that would bring in more deposits to the banking system. They can make more loans. So far from disintermediating banks, there's, you know, I would say there is no evidence that narrow banks would disintermediate banks. The banking deposit system is wildly imperfect because of these switching costs and other uh, reasons that economists have written hundreds of papers on. And it's very likely that the advent of narrow banks, the entry of narrow banks, would lead to an expansion of deposits held by broad banks and more lending, uh, in addition to uh, the good effect it would have on bank deposit rates and get money into depositors' hands, as Andy uh, pointed out to us. Now, uh, one, a couple final points before I move on to uh, financial stability, and that is, Bert used the phrase regulatory arbitrage, and Andy objected to that a little bit, and I, I have to object to that as well, because we think of regulatory arbitrage as someone doing something in one venue, and then going around regulations to do the same thing in some other venue and avoiding the regulations to do that same, usually risky thing. That is not the approach of narrow banking, of TNB, uh, in any, by any stretch of the imagination. TNB is a chartered depository institution <coughs> in the state of Connecticut. As Andy pointed out, 
it is subject to appropriate, ample, and meaningful capital requirements. And it is no way attempting to arbitrage uh, regulations by being an un unregulated entity. We are not by any means an unregulated <coughs> entity. I would point out, consider the capital requirements of a uh, bank that is a custodian bank, the very largest banks in the nation, some of them. JPMC, Citibank, Northern Trust, State Street, and so on. Most of those banks have $30 trillion. Several of those banks have more than $30 trillion in custodial assets. Now, those assets aren't on the balance sheet of that bank. Do they pay any capital requirements, leverage capital requirements, risk-based capital requirements on those custodial assets? Absolutely not. Why? Because those, bank, those assets pay, you know, impose no risk on those banks. They're not owned by the banks. They're not on the balance sheet of the banks. Do Federal Reserve deposits impose any risk on the narrow bank? No. None whatsoever. Is the narrow bank subject to the same capital requirements as those custodial banks? No. We have higher capital requirements. We'd be subject to the operational risk capital requirements, just like those banks, and we would have an additional requirements related to our state requirements. So, it's the same capital regime as a custodial bank, and it's, that, that's the way to think about it. Now, the difference in scale, people talk about fraud risk. I was reading uh, JPMC's 2016 annual report. The amount of value transfers they do per day in 2016 was $5 trillion. If one is concerned about fraud risk, one need no, look no further than our existing banking system. And as uh, the uh, scholar Charles Perot talked to us, uh, taught us in the book Normal Accidents, fraud and operational risk are a combination of highly coupled systems. These are systems where a lot of different things have to go right for the, for the process to work, and complex systems. Uh, of course, we've designed the narrow bank to be simple and not highly coupled. We have extraordinary fraud controls. We are supervised. And many of these financial innovations that we've seen over the decades, money market mutual funds, uh, fintech, uh, you know, uh, the uh, conduits and, and uh, other uh, off-balance sheet entities, these are regulatory arbitrage. <laughs> A depository institution chartered in Connecticut to uh, do this provide this basic depository service is not a regulatory arbitrage. It is a technological innovation. We're building safety rather than through guarantees. We're building safety via uh, te technologically holding a riskless asset. The final thing I'll say, kind of an introduction to my financial stability remarks, is that Bill alluded to the fact that the floor system is discredited. I don't believe that's at, at all true. and I. I I uh, think he, he jumped a little bit, uh, jumped over a few steps there. But uh, the, the point of the, and this gets to uh, the discussion of the bank reserve tax that uh, Ali pointed out and so on. It's true that there were very few reserves and the bank reserve tax was a small thing, but the behavior induced by this uh, necessity to economize on reserves was very important, and that's the key benefit of paying interest on reserves is banks can sort of exhale and they can hold liquid assets in advance of uh, you know, having the need for those liquid assets in the, in the event of large withdrawals. So uh, paying interest on reserves is a big deal even though that reserve tax itself was small. The behavior induced by that stringency was very large. And now I'd like to talk <laughs> about the financial stability. And by the way, thank you, Bill, for the new acronym, uh, J, uh, what was it? I'm sorry, J, uh, JNBI. J I'll accept JNBI if the J stands for James Tobin, uh, the greatest uh, uh, monetary economist of the 20th century. Because in two papers in 1985 and 1987, he recommended the supplement, to supplement our current financial system by having narrow banks, essentially of the type that uh, TNB is. And his idea was for financial stability, and I'll, and I'll talk about that. What was one of the most widely cited 
proximate causes of the crisis. It was the rise of large cash pools. These are very large uh, pools of funding that, is, that are very far in excess of the FDIC limit, and so that uh, these funds are not perfectly safe if uh, deposited at banks. This led to uh, a, a very significant competition in the creation of VRDOs, auction rate securities, asset-backed commercial paper, money market mutual funds, and so on, the true alphabet soup of the shadow banking system, and the incredible growth of those, those uh, deposits. All of those instruments were subject to runs in 2007 and 2008, and the threat of runs. And that caused the financial crisis. That was the proximate cause of the financial crisis. What was the fix? Good question. <laughs> The fix at the time was guarantees. The FDIC engaged in the temporary liquidity guarantee program, which included the temporary account guarantee program, which guaranteed over $1.4 trillion of bank accounts, and the, uh, the uh, loan guarantee program, which insured over $345 billion of loans issued by banks. The uh, Treasury of the United States enacted the temporary guarantee for money market mutual funds, over $2.4 trillion of guarantees. This is exactly, getting back to James Tobin, this is exactly why James Tobin recommended narrow banks. In 1985 and 1987, he foresaw this. He said, look, we have a financial system that's dominated by what? By deposit insurance. And he said, deposit insurance is costly, and it certainly is costly, not only in the moral hazard, as many economists recognize, but in all the efforts to constrain the moral hazard, the supervision, the regulation, the, necess the necessity for capital requirements to serve as a first loss tranche uh, for banks and so on. And he said, this is a very costly thing and there's no way out of it. You can't, you can't constrain it because you need it. He was saying there's no way out of it directly through, you know, making uh, deposit insurance more stingy or something like that. No, he said that's not going to work because you need it. The only way out of it, he said, was to compete with deposit insurance by creating a narrow bank that would provide safety in an alternative manner. It's, it's having different tools for different people. And narrow banks are, although, again, the impetus for the narrow bank was to create competition for these deposits, they do serve as this uh, safe depository for these large cash pools that are, whose deposits are in excess of the FDIC limit. And so they have a very important um, financial stability role. And one of the key paradoxes in the, in the Fed's uh, ANPR is the following. If one is concerned about runs in a financial crisis into a safe depository, what should one do about that? Well, my answer is clear. Create the safe depository before the financial crisis. And that will reduce the fuel, the kindling, that will be there for the run to occur in the first place. So that's the essential financial stability enhancement that narrow banks bring. How do we know this works? Because of the Fed's operation of its narrow banks. The overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility, as documented by, again, Simon Potter, the SOMA manager, in, in answer to George, he pointed out how the ONRP acted as a shock absorber during the money market mutual fund reform in 2016. Over a trillion dollars had to move from prime money market mutual funds, ultimately, to treasury only money market mutual funds, government only money market mutual funds. And this, these funds came in quickly. And the, Treasury Money Market Mutual Fund has to deal with, you know, several hundred million dollars coming in on a Friday night. What are they going to do? Well, they had the option to invest in the ONRP. The ONRP ex expanded. Market rates were not affected. And the system accommodated that trillion dollars of change without any ripples in the pond of of short-term interest rates. And it enhanced financial stability greatly. This is evidence of what narrow banks can provide in normal times as sort of shock absorption. The Fed goes on to say, well, we need to stop these narrow banks because they, there could be a surge of deposits in a, in a crisis into uh, 
narrow banks? Well, my answer is we're closing the barn door after the horse has bolted the barn. We're going to experience these runs whether or not narrow banks are in existence. Currently, the runs are into too big to fail institutions and to government only money market mutual funds. Narrow banks will not stop those runs whatsoever. Narrow banks will not in any way constrain the government from creating trillions of dollars of guarantees, as is fully expected based on the, on the experience of the uh, account guarantee program, the debt guarantee program, the money market mutual fund guarantee program. The federal government, we expect the federal government to extend those guarantees in the future. But wouldn't it be better to have a technologically derived safe asset in advance of the crisis? And that's where uh, narrow banks can really make a difference in financial stability. Thanks very much, appreciate it. Thanks. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of points here I wanna bring up uh, from the two panels. <coughs> One is uh, this issue of paying interest on reserves in uh, tax versus a subsidy. I want to come back a little bit to rulemaking and whether the Fed actually has rulemaking power. To touch on disintermediation a bit and maybe a bit on uh, regulatory arbitrage. So first of all, it's important to realize that um, banks had required reserve requirements, requ reserve requirements on certain accounts. So they had to hold a percentage of certain type of deposit accounts in the Fed unremunerated. That, that was the rule. But they could hold more than that, which are excess reserves. And so the tax for reserves, where the original interest on reserves was supposed to do away with, was really only on required reserves, the part that the, they were mandated to keep in the central bank in a fractional reserve banking system. So that is really, and it's very tiny bit of bank reserves. So that the tax piece of that whole logic comes in only for required reserves, which were, which were minimal, which were minimal. So the, the issue then is banks have lots of reserves that are way, way, mo almost all of their reserves are excess reserves, which means the banks choose voluntarily to keep their reserves in a federal reserve account. Now, there is, no, there is no tax issue there or not because they're not required to do it. They don't have to pay anything. They, they merely either choose to keep their money there or not, or do, it, do something else. So they're only going to keep their money there at the Federal Reserve in the, in, in, in the terms of excess reserves if, if it pays a better rate than they can earn somewhere else, given the risk and the, and the transaction costs and everything. So, there's a question whether they're getting paid a fair rate of return on their excess returns or were more than a fair rate of return. And I think there's a legitimate debate about whether what they're getting paid on excess reserves is more than they could earn otherwise or not. But, but the issue, so the tax issue really only applies to required reserves, and that's really not an important part of the debate. But then it comes about to rulemaking. So in the beginning, Ali, when he monitored, and I would never argue with him on a legal basis because I would totally lose, says the Federal Reserve has the right uh, to write these rules. And because it does say in the statute, the 2006 statute, that they can pay interest on reserves. And the second point is, and the Fed has the authority to write rulemaking uh, authority to, to, to implement this statute. But what they meant in Congress, because I've talked to the folks that were the staff in the 2006 conference when the bill was passed, they, the Fed was supposed to have the right to decide how to apply the rule to required reserves and excess reserves. And when the Federal Reserve first started paying interest on reserves in November of 2008, they paid different rates on required reserves and excess reserves. But that didn't work, and after a month they abandoned that, and they just started paying on reserves in general. So the rulemaking authority were, was really about the fine print of how you got paid interest on your required reserves versus how you got paid interest on your excess reserves. For example, what was the balances of your required reserves? What was the period over it was? Was it a 360-day interest rate, a 365-day interest rate? All the fine print that you would find in the bottom of a truth and lending statement, the Fed was empowered to write those rules. It was never empowered, or at least the Congress never thought so, that they would apply different rates to different kinds of banks. That was never envisioned in 2006. 
I talked to the staff people behind the bill. They said, no, we're, we're, we're appalled at this. We never thought this would ever, was ever what we were giving them rulemaking authority. So, so the, in fact, they have given them rulemaking authority, and the Fed is stretching the rules, as they always do, to do, do whatever it is they want to do, like get rid of the narrow bank. But this was never the intent of Congress, and I think, I think it's Congress's job to step up and take a look at this and say, you know, are you guys really doing what we, we asked you to do? And I think the answer is clearly no, and I think we need hearings on that. Uh, so I think the rules and the tax and the subsidy, they all go in, and, and it's a complicated system, but it's really an important, important one. When we come back to disintermediation and, and this notion that maybe the narrow bank will cause disintermediation, well, the IOER, start, when, they bank, when the Fed started paying interest on bank reserves, excess reserves, it caused disintermediation. Deposits, on average, supported $93. $1 worth of deposit supported 93 cents of loans before interest on reserves. And after interest on reserves, only 70 cents on the dollar. So if you think of intermediation as bank deposits funding loans, the act of paying IOER reduced the amount of bank deposits that funded loans in the system. I mean, banks started putting their money in Federal Reserve, excess reserves, and earning interest on that instead of making loans. Now, of course, the economy was in the dumps, and you have to risk adjust and all that. But clearly, excess reserves were a better deal for banks at the time than were loans, or they would have made loans, since they didn't have to hold excess reserves. When we come back to the idea of the narrow bank and would it, would it muck things up, well, if the whole idea of paying interest on required reserves was to get rid of this sort of tax on banks to hold required reserves and all the get rid of all this extra resources they were doing to do sweep accounts and all this kind of other stuff that was expensive in order to minimize required reserves and the tax, well, the reverse repo facility is expensive, too. You've got to move around securities, and you have fiduciaries involved, and you have to do something every day. It's much simpler just to put your money in the narrow bank and let the narrow bank put reserves in there. So it saves all the transactions costs of having to do this extra facility to keep the, the federal funds rate from falling too far below the IOER floor. So you know, the, same, the narrow bank is the same medicine that, that uh, the, essentially the the interest on reserves was for the tax. So that doesn't seem to hold a lot of water. And if we really want to come back to arbitrage, I, I, regulatory arbitrage, when there's, when there's basically no risk, there's no regulatory arbitrage, they're not, they're not trying to take risks that aren't accounted for. If you really want to look at re regulatory arbitrage, it's the foreign bank, foreign bank branches, which don't have to pay deposit insurance premiums. They don't lend money. They don't take retail deposits. So what did they do? They swept up all the GSE money in federal funds and invested it in the IOER to earn a spread. So the, the real arbitrage for the last 10 years has been the foreign, foreign banks in the US. And if you're really worried about the arbitrage story, I think that, that's kind of where I would focus on and not, not on a narrow bank. But um, I'll let you react to my, my comments here and, and to each other's comments. Well, I'd just uh, say thanks very much, Paul. I, I'd say that, you know, the um, Federal Reserve Board governors uh, testified several times between 1999 and 2006 uh, in favor of the payment of interest on reserves and in, in favor simultaneously of the payment of interest on corporate accounts, which we finally got in the Dodd-Frank uh, bill, the payment of interest by commercial banks on corporate accounts. Um, and they saw those two things as paired. And if you, read, if you read the testimony, Larry Myers, I think, was the first one to testify, but also Ferguson and I believe Johnson also testified. Um, he points out that, you know, there's a natural um, uh, pass-through that should occur in that uh, banks would have to pay higher interest rates on their corporate accounts, but they could uh, be able to... Uh, uh, to fund this from revenue from interest on reserves. So they clearly saw that interest on reserves should be passed through to depositors. And that's, that's a key, that should be a key principle that the Federal Reserve, just as Andy is saying, it's a key principle that the Federal Reserve should be um, promoting rather than somehow trying to, to discourage it. Um, I also think very clearly that Jerry's last slide is exactly right. Um, the, the innovation really has already occurred with the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility, a narrow bank. Uh, 
it's, it's a narrow bank. They, they have 164 uh, counterparties. None of them are banks. Uh, well, I guess some are banks, but the main users are money market mutual funds and the federal home loan banks. And um, that's been an operation. Uh, there's been no uh, significant problems. And in fact, we have found, and I uh, direct you to the December 2nd, uh, 2018 minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee, where they pointed out that one of the problems they have in getting back down to the Bill Nelson, uh, very small balance sheet, Bill Nelson and, and George also suggest this, very small balance sheet, is the fact that they have found through experimentation, through innovation, during this period of payment of interest on reserves at the Treasury account, the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility, the foreign repo pool, and the accounts of depository uh, designated financial market utilities have been uh, useful to our financial system. These accounts have averaged about $700 billion over the last several years. And Lori Logan in 2017, uh, I believe it was May 2017, gave a very nice speech that documented the variability in these accounts for the Federal Reserve. And she pointed out that they're highly variable, that if you wanted to um, have enough of reserves in, um, uh, in um, existence to allow the natural flow to and from these accounts, you would need uh, like $250 billion or more in excess of the $700 billion that's there on average. So you need a trillion dollars of reserves not to service banks, commercial banks. This is a new type of financial, uh, uh, financial instrument. Treasury accounts, accounts for foreign central banks, accounts for money market mutual funds, they don't call them accounts, but they're accounts in all, all but name, as Bill Nelson pointed out, and uh, accounts for designated financial market utilities. $700 billion. We didn't have these. We just discovered these during this period of experimentation by the Federal Reserve. In its December 2nd, 2018 uh, minutes, the Federal Reserve was talking about the Treasury accounts and the foreign repo pool and said these, these balances are socially beneficial. I fully agree with them. They are socially beneficial. We should keep them. The Federal Reserve plans to keep them. That's why they're going to wind up with a larger balance sheet than what is needed by, by commercial banks. It's, it's very different. The Fed's balance sheet, the terminal size of the Fed's balance sheet is determined by these four groups of depositors, not by the commercial bank's needs. But I believe that's important and correct because these essentially are narrow banks and the Federal Reserve has found the benefit of narrow banks. What the Federal Reserve is saying through this rule through its opposition to my bank, is that narrow banking should not be done by the private sector. They're definitely saying narrow banks should be done. They say it's socially beneficial. Uh, and uh, I believe it should be uh, done by the private sector, and that sort of experimentation should be allowed. Yeah, um, I want to say, I want to uh, respond to the last thing Jamie said. I was originally going to make a comment, which I still will, if I may that designed to get us to agree, but I have mm -hmm. to start by disagreeing. When the Fed moved to a floor system, before the floor system, 2008, the Treasury used so-called T, T and L accounts in commercial banks, and it, it used them to buffer shifts of funds into its TGA account so that there wouldn't be a lot of disturbance to the quantity of bank reserves, and the mm -hmm. Fed's open market operations would not be made too difficult. The volatility or variability of the TGA balance is jumped up after. It must be very loose. Just keep going. Well. Hold on a second. Try right, again. But you're just gesticulating. Jumping. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the, volat the variability of the TGA balances was a response to the fact that with the floor system, it no longer mattered whether the, TG whether the Treasury did this or not. And it was more profitable to the Treasury to just put all their money straight into TGA balances. So, this is a, a good example of something where it wasn't that, oh, TGA uh, balances became volatile, so now we have to have the floor system. The floor system's adoption led to changes in the behavior of the Treasury management of its accounts. So I don't know so much about the swaps. I haven't looked into them. But I read uh, Lori Logan's speech, and I thought, no, this is just not the right way to argue. You're treating a new situation that's a response to the new operating system as if,
it was a situation that was uh, in, in it, 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 it was uh, bound to be the case and make it impossible to you to go back to the old system. So I want to push back against that. On the other hand, I want to kind of see if Jamie and I. I mean, I agree with 99% of Jamie's positions, except that I don't like floor system. Um, I wanted to start by saying. Wanting to have a corridor system is, first of all, not the same as wanting to get rid of interest on reserves. Most right, corridor right. systems have interest on reserves, and they can even have the equivalent of interest on excess reserves. Uh, furthermore, having a corridor system doesn't mean that interest is made available only to what we call commercial banks. There's no reason why the lower bound of the corridor can't be a deposit rate that's available to a wide set of depository institutions, including money market funds. And so you could have the equivalent of the present, present ONRRP facility be uh, uh, what maintains, what's, the, what's instead of having interest on reserves, it's a deposit facility available to all financial institutions. Then the question becomes uh, whether it's, um, uh, 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 whether that would address some of the issues having that kind of system that Jamie uh, argues that the narrow bank could accomplish in the present floor system, and that becomes a, the rub. Now, th that last comment, uh, of course, a difference, the difference, or one, one of the key differences in a corridor system is that the policy rate is somewhere between the lower bound or the deposit rate, the interest on reserves rate, and an upper bound that could be discount rate or window rate, or it could be something like the standing repo facility that's being proposed, which I think is a good idea. Uh, if it's below, right? If it's below, then it's clearly not as attractive. Uh, uh, if the deposit rate is, is is not as attractive, but that brings us back to the 2006 statute. According to that statute, if we're going to insist on it being honored in spirit and as well as in the letter, the Fed was supposed to pay interest on reserves at a rate not to exceed the general level of short-term interest rates. That's in the statute. It wasn't changed in 2008 when they advanced the implementation of the rule. But the way the Fed has gotten away with having IOER for a long stretch of time above any conceivable measure of a market short-term interest rate, which was true until maybe a year ago, was by writing the regulation, by writing the rule, when they got around to it in 2015, they said, well, here's what we consider short-term market interest rates or short-term rates for the purpose of implementing the statute. Never mind the other stuff they put on there, which included a lot of longer-term rates, which is an odd way to do it. Uh, but they included the Fed's primary credit rate, which is by design set way above all market short-term interest rates. And hey, presto, the Fed could set the IOER way above other money market rates. And it's only when that's the case that a project like TNB and others like it offers any real uh, temptation or opportunities. Hey, George, let's so, try to take one question. Yeah, so anyway. Can I, I say something? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to say something, Jerry? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I thought you, go ahead. Oh, you're getting cut off completely. Well, no, I'm, gonna, I'm done. We've I'm got a sentence. I was two done. minutes. Yeah. Um, this has been an ongoing conversation between Paul and me about interest on excess reserves. The thing is, okay, excess reserves and reserves are two different things required. But the question is the following. How much does it cost to create a dollar of reserves? Uh, the answer is zero, literally zero. What is the federal funds market? The federal funds market is a, is a market where people who get paid quite a lot of money economize on something that can be created for zero. That's not efficient. It's just not. And so that's why the interest rate on excess reserves equal to basically the risk-free rate is efficient. Yeah, it I, it I, creates I, an efficient I, allocation I, of resources. It's not a subsidy. It is if it's above. It's inefficient to have it at zero. Yeah, well, he agrees with that. Yeah. <laughs> On excess reserves. Yeah, but you wouldn't have excess yes. reserves if if they're not if you if yes. if you could earn money on excess reserves and the Fed paid zero, you had hardly any excess reserves, a, which is thing. what happened before. Yeah, no questions about oh. insurance company risk models. <laughs> okay.
jump cost into a financial crisis. And so that's a big jump option cost. And then there's the normal sort of diffusion cost of the normal market volatility. And so if we take, if the Fed explicitly charged these two option costs to these narrow banks, and then basically for regular banks, it would say, we're subsidizing them with these option costs, plus any yield differential, as George pointed out. We've chosen to subsidize regular banks with these option costs and yield differential cost because we think it promotes our ability to do monetary policy. But if everybody in the world wants to come in and pick up free option costs on jumps in the market price level and jump and diffusion option cost, the Fed would have to pay basically an, an infinite option cost to the investing world, which it couldn't pay. Uh, my, my response would be they lower the interest they pay on excess reserves and nobody wants to enter and do that deal, right? I mean, well, this is just- right. I mean, do, I, I think instead. that uh, um, Jeremy uh, Stein, uh, Sam Hansen, and, and uh, um, uh, Greenwood have a paper on this, and, and they're talking about using the overnight reverse repurchase agreement facility in this way, the Fed's narrow bank. And uh, they point out that uh, the Fed can invest in short-term treasuries, and so that, that cost is, is minimized. Well, why not calculate the, level, the option the level, cost uh, and see what it is? We have and, a question over here. <laughs> Andy? Well, I just want to, uh, I'm not sure exactly but maybe this day. Uh, when George... Sorry. When George said um, this, uh, the the narrow bank, you know, the ability to to have narrow banks could create more vigorous competition. And I thought, yeah, and that's a good could. And in fact, it it should be better than a could. It it should be a shall or a would or a will that the Federal Reserve and AI, here we are at AI, which, and when I think of like vigorous competition is like one of the foundations and pillars of the American economy. Why, when you said, Paul, this morning that this is gonna go under the radar and that the Fed's only gonna get six or eight or 10 comments, one of which is from a commercial institution that's directly affected, which they can easily dismiss those comments, I hate to say it, but people in Congress People at think tanks like Cato and AEI, and hope, I would hope Brookings, but we know probably Brookings will stay out of this one. Okay, but, but Peterson Institute, there's plenty of places in this city that would say, hey, we want vigorous competition on things that are important to the general public and that matter for ordinary people, for ordinary working families and small businesses. This cannot go under the radar, and you should not allow it. And again, I'm really glad that you organized this that's forum why today. We're, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> okay, well, again, thank, thank you. That's actually okay, a way of we're, saying We're already thank over you. time. Do I, have, do I have time for one short Bert, Bert comment? Um, yeah, uh, with regard to the notion of level playing field, we're not talking about a level playing field here. We're talking about a very, very bumpy uh, playing field among the various players. And who knows what the unintended distortions uh, will be from that bumpy uh, playing field. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, all first panel, second panel. Uh, I thought it was a great exchange of ideas and views, and um, I hope I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry that we didn't have more time for audience questions, but thank you. Thanks so much, Paul.